right, good evening everybody. I'm gonna call this meeting to order at seven o'clock on the dot. Can I please get a roll call? Yep, Donald Woodworth. Yep. Jack Sapia. Yep. Paula Kane. Here. Bree Woodworth. Here. Kim McCormick. Here. Shauna Manthorn. She's excused. Okay, Katie Knudsen. I'm here. Kristen Savage. She is probably gonna be late. Okay. And Mark Sherwood. Here. All right, if we could all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First thing is approval of the minutes. Last months or our last board meetings minutes in here. They're online, not in the packet. Huh? They're on the on the um, Okay. Everybody get a chance to look at them online? I did. Okay. All right. So you all comfortable with moving on to approve them? Yes. Okay. Well, then I make I'm a motion to approve the minutes from the, let me get the date, April 6th um, regular school board meeting. Uh, motion to have a second? It would be my pleasure to second Kim's motion. Jack seconded. Any discussion? <laughs> all those in favor? Opposed? And abstained. All right. And then we do have some on public. We actually have two sets. Comfortable if I can get a motion for the April 6th on public. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion by Mark, second by Bree. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? All right. Last set is April the 13th. Accept the meeting minutes from April 13th. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? And abstain. If you guys could pass those back, please. Now we are to our delegates and individuals. We have, I believe, four. First one up, and if I butcher your name, I do apologize. Uh, Stephanie Doyle. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I have to request, I know my time limit's three minutes. I'm at about three minutes and 20 seconds. Is that acceptable? <laughs> I'll run my Please and thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Stephanie Doyle. I am the parent of a Danville Elementary fifth grader. I am here tonight to share information with you about a recent school incident and my concerns regarding the Danville Elementary School's discipline procedures and protocols. On Wednesday, April 5th, I received a phone call at work from Principal Chris Snyder regarding an assault on my son by another fifth grader. He described the assault and told me that my son's classroom teacher needed to put herself physically between my child and his attacker to prevent further harm to my child. 
Principal Snyder did not tell me that the police were involved. I learned this from my 11-year-old son when I picked him up from school that day. In the incident report that I have obtained from the Danville Police Department, a police officer assisted school members with the attacker following the attack. In a meeting with Principal Snyder in February, I had expressed concern regarding the amount of suspensions in my son's grade level. From what I was learning from my son, as well as from other parents, suspensions were being used more frequently than I have ever experienced in my 19 years as a public school educator. There have been nine suspensions for this one child in this school year alone. In our meeting, Principal Snyder cited the process and lack of resources as handicaps to a solution that would be educationally and emotionally more suitable for this child as well as for his classmates. I am here to ask you to review the process and lack of resources that have allowed this to happen. As an experienced educator, working with challenging inner city student populations, I'm familiar with and in fact well trained to work with students who exhibit behaviors that exclude them <clears throat> from participating in a traditional classroom setting. There are therapeutic classroom settings and programs which are appropriate to meet the needs of such students. Our job as teachers and administrators is to identify those children and to develop or find a supportive learning environment for them. Danville has not done this. Rather, they have knowingly left a child who has demonstrated for almost two academic years that he is not thriving in a traditional classroom setting. And they have been repeatedly using the same behavioral consequences, suspensions. Clearly, these consequences are not working. The number of evacuations of the classroom happening on a monthly basis, the fact that students and teachers are subjected to screaming, swearing, and physically acting out, as well as the amount of incidents involving this student provide a plethora of data sufficient in proving that he's not getting the support he needs. He and the students in his class are suffering as a result. My son has been directly impacted by this student's regular outbursts and behavioral interruptions during class for this entire school year, resulting in significant loss of teaching and learning time for all. That time loss cannot be made up to them. And now, my son is more directly affected by having been physically assaulted during his school day by a student who has historically been known to exhibit violent and unpredictable behaviors. And just today, I learned that this child sent a distressing message to my son via Google Classroom. He told my son, I hope you die. These disturbing incidents have affected my son in extremely traumatic ways. Given the history of this child, this toxic behavior warrants action now. You are more than policymakers and administrators. And in today's world, you must be advocates in providing the safest learning environment for our kids. I implore you, the school board, and Interim Superintendent Krieger and Principal Snyder to take immediate action before it is too late. I am hopeful the board will ensure parents that any action needed regarding the failure of one of the Timberlane District schools to guarantee the safety and education of my son and his peers will be taken. I look forward to hearing from the district regarding any and all actions taken. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next is David Alberg. Good evening. I'm here to speak on behalf of our children at Danville Elementary. As a military veteran, I take safety as a top priority of our children, our wives, our elders, our staff, and our community. In today's world, we have no margin for error when it comes to this topic. For the last couple of years, we have struggled to keep our children safe, both physically and mentally, at Danville Elementary. As parents, we've been told of the three-pronged approach, which gives administration the right to decipher if a threat is viable or not. This perplexes me. Have they undergone training to do this? Perhaps they are veterans from, of the military or law enforcement as well? Most recently, my second grader's life was threatened because she was going on a field trip and another child in another grade was not. This is the same child that was just spoken about. When the child who made the threat returned to school from his suspension, he attacked another child that same day. Perhaps our system of letting administrators who are not trained to make the decisions on what threats are real and what ones are not is not working. Clearly this boy has every intention of carrying out his threats. If we compare our handbooks with that of other districts, they are very vague, allowing a lot to be left for the administration to determine. 
If we want fair and consistent actions across the board, why wouldn't we lay out the rules and repercussions clearly, allowing the punishment to fit the crime in black and white? I am here tonight to state that our system is broken. We have a violent child within the four walls of a building that is not equipped to support him. When this child turns 12 and the law steps in, how did we help him? Did we set him up to succeed? When I get a call one day that my child is not coming home, can you undo all the protection that you have given to this one child at the expense of all the other children? I sure hope so. We're at a crossroads. Every time a violent tragedy strikes a school anywhere, we cry out. Were there signs? Were the signs seen and not acted upon? Why didn't anyone react to those signs? Why didn't they help the individual and stop a tragedy? We now have some of those signs staring us right in the face right now. How are we going to react? Thank you. Thank you. Bill Preble? Um, sure. I don't believe he's here for delegates and individuals. Are you? you feel no. Oh, no, no. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. Well, then we only have I thought that was just for pending. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Exhale. No. <laughs> Sorry. Jennifer Conti. So Jennifer is going to be uh, for agenda item number one. All right. So then that is all for delegates and individuals then. Thank you for filling these out though. <laughs> I know, right? All right. Next is our student representative. Welcome back. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So, last time I barely had anything to talk about the high school, this time they wouldn't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> My filter's kind of gone out the window today. <laughs> Let me know when you're done. The run of the savages was last Saturday with 354 people crossing the finish line and over 400 in attendance. Estimated to have raised over $10,000 this year and a 12-year total of $85,000 to the Jimmy Fund. The run of the savages will be back next year on April 13th. <laughs> Tomorrow morning in the pack in the pack senior the senior panel will take place. Incoming freshmen will get to hear from seniors about their experience in high school and talking about different clubs and activities they were involved in. The following seniors are on the panel. Jake Balicki, Jack Birdsell, Evan Doherty, Samantha Fowler, Jackie Fuller, Anna Hammer, Ella Murray, Land Landon Pagello, Emma Susi, Thomas Young, Cam Zimbrovich, and yours truly. <laughs> Sustainability Club joined forces with Project Hope, opening a pop-up thrift store in the high school calf on Monday the 17th. Students donated their lightly used clothes for the Sustainability Club to sell. A portion of the profits raised goes to Project Hope. The sophomore dance took place on Saturday the 15th. Students had a great time calling it quote-unquote lit. <laughs> <laughs> the class of 2026 had a bake sale today and will also have one tomorrow. All proceeds raised go towards the 2026 class. GSA is having a day of silence on Friday to stand for people who have to stay quiet about their identities. The Milkman Show is on Friday at 7 o'clock in the Pack Recital Hall. My Fair Lady premieres May 4th, 5th, and 6th, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights at 7 with a matinee Saturday at 1. May 11th, 12th, and 13th, the Timberland players have their one-act play. AP exams start on May 10th. The Student Council Banquet is on May 15th. Student Council will be hosting a Big Buddy, Little Buddy Day on May 16th. Atkinson Academy's third grade classes will be coming to the high school to meet their Big Buddy and spend the day with them. Thursday, May 18th, Fatal Reality will be happening in the pack to educate the senior class about the dangers of drinking and driving. Prom is on May 19th at Atkinson Country Club 
Tickets are currently being sold during lunches. The music department will be le leaving this Saturday to go to Disney to perform in venues all over the Disney Resort. They will also be marching in a parade on Main Street, USA. Teacher Appreciation Week is on Monday, May 8th through Friday the 12th. Thank you to all the teachers in the district for everything you do. There was an assembly today in the PAC. A speaker talked about the importance of mental health and the importance of asking for help when you need it. Bring a, ch bring a Child to School Day is tomorrow from 7.30 to 10.30, hosted by Ms. Cerny and her child development and child care classes. Danville Elementary, the Spring Scholastic Book Fair is happening right now and many thanks to the families who have supported it. The fifth grade, the fifth grade class helped organize a school-wide spirit week at Danville. Many staff and students have participated with daily themes of pajama day, sports day, grade level color day, crazy hair slash hat day, and earth day slash kindness day. Danville wishes everyone a safe and fun April break. Sandown Central. Sandown Central would like to thank Michelle Parker for organizing the Scholastic Book Fair. The students are so excited to shop for new books. Families were invited to shop together Wednesday from 3.30 to 6. Sandown Central hopes everyone has a safe and great spring break. This Sandown North this month, Sandown North paused to show school appreciation for their fabulous paraprofessionals. Sandown's hardworking, supportive assistant principal, their creative librarian and librarian assistant, and their awesome occupational therapist and OT assistant. Thank you for all you do to help the community grow. On Tuesday, the Wellness Committee hosted an indoor Gaga game Called, played by members of the Sandown staff versus fifth grade students. Everyone had a great time and the students were happy that they probably won. <laughs> <laughs> Today, fifth grade Mackenzie Hallahan was principal of the day. She won the job by selling the most PTA fundraising calendars at Sandown North. Mackenzie was a fantastic principal and assisted with morning greetings, hosted the Sandown Summit meeting, visited classrooms to read to students, helped with recess duty, and treated staff to coffee and snacks. And that concludes my speech. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to current business, student, staff, and family share. So we had talked about uh, with the board maybe having a standing agenda item, maybe it's once a month or maybe twice a month where we would host a student a staff member or a family uh, or maybe a group of them and just highlight something that um, they wanted to share about their experiences in, in our Timberland schools. So Jennifer Conti was, was gracious enough to kind of kick off this entire thing tonight. <laughs> uh, the impetus for that, she had emailed, she had an experience over at Pollard in an event that they held, I think, outside of the school setting. Yep. Uh, and uh, just kind of wrote about that experience, what it meant for uh, her children, uh, what it meant for her as a, as a mom. Um, and she also shared that with the principal, which I greatly appreciate. Um, so we were hoping that we could create these forums so you folks could hear about some things going on in schools, but it's also meant to be interactive so Jennifer understands that you know there could be questions or things you want to dig into with her after she's <laughs> kind of done sharing that experience with us. So I'll turn it to you, Jennifer. Thank All you right. so much for sharing. Um, thank you. So first, I'd just like to thank you for inviting us tonight and the school board for welcoming us. Um, my family was just with me a few minutes ago. You probably saw them. So my husband, my, um, my second grade son, Kyle, and then my daughter, Caroline, who um, will be an incoming kindergartner to Pollard um, in the fall. So, um, so thanks. And I, yeah, I was just hoping to kind of share our experience. It was a really positive experience that kind of reached outside of the classroom walls um, that really enriched our kind of family experience along with Pollard. So um, last week, our son Kyle, the second grader, um, performed along with his Pollard school classmates in the second grade play, How Does Your Garden Grow? Um, he played a weed, and <laughs> other classmates took on the roles like flowers, vegetables, garden gnomes, the gardener, all, all of that. Um, Kyle and his classmates have been preparing for months in their classrooms, in their music classes. They took a trip to the pack. 
um, on a remote snow day. I got to kind of have a little sneak peek because he had music class that day. So <laughs> he um, he kind of banned me to the other room while he was practicing, but I still kind of got a little sneak peek. Um, so Kyle had shared with us that he was only going to lip sync. Um, his teacher said it was okay, and he was like really kind of nervous. So we did a lot at home to prep him for what it might be like to be on stage, and I know that his teachers um, and team of teachers worked with him and all of his peers to prep them for what it would be like when they got on stage. Um, we really did not know how it would go as a family and as his cheering section. And he got out there and started moving when the music started and then singing, and we were like, wow, he's doing it. and finally smiling and relaxing and um, the word that kind of came to mind was just he was really confident um, he was confident in that experience and as a parent who has walked out of other theater performances with him <laughs> um, just because the sensory experience for him in particular um, and for his unique needs can be really overwhelming um, we did not know how that was going to go, and that, so that was really a true gift to us um, as a family. Um, my husband and then Kyle's grandparents were there too, and it really, um, it really was a gift. So the fact that um, he participated in the way that he did means that he felt so safe to do that and prepared, um, and we really can't thank his wonderful team of teachers enough for providing that environment for him. But I think that every student probably in that environment also felt the same, whether they were nervous or not. Some of them had prepared speaking lines. Some of them were, like Kyle, just singing and dancing um, along with their peers. Um, but I felt like it truly wouldn't have happened on stage if it wasn't something that they experienced day in and day out in their classrooms, to feel that sense of safety, to feel that sense of community, and then to bring it and share it outside of the classroom walls with their greater community. Um, so for all of them, this particular grade had a unique start to their schooling. They were in pre-K when their year got cut short, and then many of them came back as a hybrid kindergartner or a remote kindergartner, and so it was a true accomplishment for them all to be all together up on stage and sharing that with their families. Um, so the patience and thoughtfulness of all of their teachers that it took to kind of show off these student strengths <coughs> didn't go unnoticed by us and I know the second grade community of parents and families. Um, and I just wanted to say that we really are truly a fortunate community to have experiences like that for our students and families. Um, the success, I'm sure, took a lot of extra time, extra work, extra organization, extra patience, um, a lot of extra from their team of teachers that worked on this. Um, and so um, for Kyle in particular, it was a very memorable experience. It was very meaningful. Um, it was an experience where he overcame some fears. He was able to practice his self-regulatory skills you know, when he got up on stage and everybody was yelling for their kids, <laughs> I thought he was, might walk off stage, but he didn't. He was able to kind of access all of those skills that he learns in the classroom to bring them outside of the classroom. Um, and he felt a sense of pride for his accomplishment, and I think that all of the, the other, um, his peers did too. So as parents, we're really fortunate to have seen him in such a different light. Um, and just all around, it was a really wonderful evening, a wonderful experience, and I wanted to extend my thanks and gratitude to the, that second grade team and to all of the teachers that really um, worked with them to, um, to have that experience and provide such a sense of um, community. So um, that's really all I had to share, but well, thank you very much. Nice. That's an awesome thank story. Thank you so much. <laughs> so the, I'm just gonna jump on that. The second grade play at Pollard, I have experience with is I'm sure every school does a, an event that's awesome, but this the second grade How Did Your Garden Grow is an incredible thing. It's been I don't know 20 years. It's it's been a long time. Yeah. Colleen Ferrante, I know um, she's a teacher there. Her mother made the costumes, <laughs> and it's still the costumes. The weeds rock. The weeds are like awesome. <laughs> They're so awesome. But I know Dean has all of these. They're on Vimeo, yeah, and you yeah, can watch yeah, them. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, there, but it's it's just an awesome play. It's a fun play. It's an energetic one. So as you're telling this, and I've sat through the play, man, it's awesome to hear that. And I'm just, I'm glad your son had a great experience. Yeah, and I'm gra you. glad it's a tradition that continues because I had a son that was a seed and I had a son that was herb. So I, I, <laughs> I like, but the weeds were the best. Of <laughs> so congratulations to yeah. your family oh, and your son you. too. Thank you. And thank you for welcoming me to kind of share that experience with you all. So thank you. Thank you so <laughs> thank much. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. All right. Next is the Center for School Climate and Learning. So we've invited uh, Dr. Bill Preble uh, here tonight from the Center for School Climate and Learning. Um, we are going to be engaging uh, with that organization and with Bill uh, at the outset of next year, uh, both at the middle school level and the high school level. Uh, Bill's here to kind of just really quickly present like that process. What does it look like in the schools? Uh, and then also to present a little bit about the outcomes, like what, what do schools uh, and students and staff and communities gain from, from this type of work. Um, really, essentially, the work is rooted in um, students partnering with, with staff in the building, looking closely at data sources, and then uh, making some recommendations uh, to continue great practices in the school or create ones that don't exist based on those data sources, and then implementing those measures together. So it really it truly is youth participatory uh, action research that they're engaged in. Um, so I'm not going to talk and steal anything, Bill, you're going to say, but <laughs> we'd love to, for you to outline the process and then some of those outcomes for us. But what I love, thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. For, I'll stop and just say thank you for what you're doing for your community as board folks. Um, superintendents, principals, this is the hardest um, time in public education that I can remember. And I really, I don't know if this There you go. <laughs> I started this work when I looked like that. <laughs> it's been a long time, and I've seen a lot of really amazing things. I love the weed story because it reminds me of, we talk about school climate and school culture, and those are kind of buzzwords that are starting to mean about as much as bullying means. It's like we use these words for everything, and nobody really, everybody has their own meaning. So part of what we really do is... The mic? Um, you need use the mic. We need, we need you to use the microphone. Closer to the mic. Sorry about that. <laughs> Should I sit here? And yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to carry it around I'm with bad. you. No, no. no. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. okay. It's just better. Yeah. All right. So Bill Preble, Center for School Climate and Learning, uh, <laughs> Professor of Educational Leadership at New England College. I teach in the doctoral program there. I have the best job in the world. But um, my other job is I run this, um, this essentially research center um, for youth. Um, we train um, third graders through 12th graders to be action researchers, leaders. Um, so they come together um, and we um, have a very specific process for bringing students from your schools together. Um, the way I summarize it really quickly is we want a really diverse group of kids because every student, we just heard stories of three or four students here I, th I think they're all having very unique, different educational experiences. So when we create a leadership team, the worst thing we do is pick all the leaders, because those are usually kids that are experiencing something kind of similar. What we want is, we really say at the high school, middle school, have the adults walk around the lunchroom and pick one kid from every lunch table who's willing to talk with you. Does that give you a different set of perspectives about the school? So it, get, it kind of begs the question, is there actually anything could you, could you say that there is actually anything like a safe school or a respectful school? Or does it kind of depend on who you are? And I think that's the challenge. So when we talk about, oh, we have a respectful school. If you ask 10 kids, if they were from one lunch table each about respect in the school or about safety in the school, my guess is they would all have very different stories. And so the only way to really begin to get a, the pulse of the school is to do what we call youth participatory action research. Let these kids capture the story as globally as they can of what's happening, what's working, what's not working, what's scary, what's wonderful, how are those weeds doing, <laughs> how are the kids who are in that classroom we just heard about doing. And let's try to somehow take that complicated story and make it really accessible to everybody so we can pick some things that we really need to work on. And just as importantly, just like you just did, Justin, we're gonna pick some things that we are gonna celebrate because there's both, there's both things. There's the celebration things that we need to keep our eye on, and there's those really challenging issues that we have to equally keep our eye on. So, I'm sorry, I'm not using this flicker very well. 
Um, we've been doing this a long time. Like I said, I won't brag, but we worked everywhere. <laughs> um, um, I really appreciate the longevity of my opportunity to do this work. Today I was at a meeting in a superintendent's office with an assistant superintendent who was talking about the school climate leadership work that was happening in her middle school. And she said, Bill, I can't believe that the kids from the middle school came up to the superintendent's office and, and engaged us in a dialogue about effective use of a particular technology-based learning program that they were witnessing every day in their classrooms 100% failing. And they were spending thousands and thousands of dollars on this technology-based program to help their kids recover uh, academic learning loss. And these kids had such great feedback for the assistant superintendent and the curriculum coordinator. And this woman was saying, I was so proud of those kids leading this dialogue that now the whole district is listening to what the kids are telling us. How how are we implementing this program that we really believe in with fidelity or not? Because the programs are fine. It's just if you don't implement with the fidelity, then they don't work. So they're really partnering with kids on something as fundamental as how to use technology-based recovery programs to get kids caught up after the pandemic. Those are middle school kids. Um, so I love this quote, school climate. Um, it's like the air we breathe, it tends to go unnoticed until it becomes toxic. And Jet, sir, I appreciated your story and I think this issue of safety in school is on everybody's mind. And sometimes the only times we talk about it is when we have these, tr these, these crises, these problems. The fact that you guys are proactively looking at addressing climate and culture issues before there's a crisis and leveraging what we can do really positively drawing on 20 years of traditions of certain kinds of activities we do that are beautiful and we work great. How do we continue to grow more of those bright spots in our culture, in our school, instead of just reacting to the negative? So I like, I like Freiburg's idea here that, you know, we have to pay attention before it's toxic. So our little theory of action is this. It's all about the grown-ups. This is an amazing quote <laughs> from a really um, well-respected organizational leadership guy that if you think about the Boston Celtics or um, you know, the, the, the best football teams, the Patriots and all this stuff, they all talk about the same thing. It's the culture of the organization that drives success. So what is that culture? How do you unpack it? How do you measure it? How do you understand what's working and what's not working? Well, that's what we, we use action research for. We understand the adult issues going on in the school because that's where the action is. The adults create the context. But that climate piece, it's the feeling tone. When you walk in a building, you can feel the, cult, the climate of a building. You can feel it as a safe place, as a place, all these words you have <laughs> on, the, on the walls. You can feel those things in the air of a, of a school or organization. We've spent a long time figuring out how to measure those empirically, both with numbers, quantitatively, so we can see. So the question for that elementary school where we're talking about safety, what percentage of the students are being affected by those conditions that you're talking about? It's a really important. Is it, is it a quarter of the kids that are being affected by that? If it is, we can, we can get a handle on that. Is it, is it three quarters of the kids that are being affected by threats and stuff? If that's the case, we got to really, so we think you have to put these things into some magnitude, and that's why we do this, this quantitative piece. You've got in your packet the school climate survey. One thing, one warning about the school climate survey, I really wish you would don't read the definition of school climate that the State Department of Education of New Hampshire has on their <laughs> website, because it's not, it's not what we measure for school climate. So we measure the academic learning climate in a school. We call that school climate. What the YRBS measures is what the state's definition of school climate. They call that YRBS survey a school climate survey, and it is not. It is a, it's a psychological survey of kids' social, emotional needs, well-being, and all kinds of other things that I honestly would not want my children to fill out as a parent if I didn't give my permission to do that. And that's what the state requires. If you hold up this questionnaire that we use to that, you'll see it's a completely different questionnaire, and I'll get to what we measure in a minute. So when I said it's all about the adults, we just use the research. You know, I, I teach in a doctoral program. We, we teach people how to be educational leaders and conduct original research and write books and articles about the things they learn. 
we think this is the most important piece of research that's around right now. And it says that when the grown-ups have their act together and they really happily and confidently work together, it's incredibly powerful academically. If you look at this chart, this is Hattie's research. Almost every program that you as a board are asked to adopt or previous boards have adopted for math and science and social studies, if you measure the effect on learning of those programs, see that, air, that line going straight up? It's about a 0.4 effect on academic learning. Just, it's, just, it's a small number. So most of the things we do have a 0.4 effect. If you get those adults, like those second grade team doing the theater production and spending all the extra time and doing all that stuff, that level of energy where the adults putting their heads together and figuring stuff out, like they did with COVID, by the way, like they did with COVID. Look at the size, 1.57 effect size. Why would you not work on the things that are the most biggest bang for the buck? So we try to work on finding ways to get teachers to come together, look at the things that they believe are important and talk about those, but then also look at the things that students believe are important too and give that equal attention and look at the things that parents think are important. And that's our survey data. So if you look at the three columns, we have parent data, student data, uh, teacher data. And I'll tell you right now, it's all different. So it's really fun when they get the data back to go, here's what the teacher said is going on, and here's <laughs> what the kids say are going on on those same issues, and here's what the parents say are going on. And it's a wonderful conversation to try to figure out which of those stories is actually accurate for, remember, not for everybody, but for individual kids. So when the teachers say, um, I know my students' talents, strengths, and interests, 89% of the teachers say, I know my students' talents, strengths, and interests. And the kids say, 42% of the kids say, my teachers know my talents, strengths, and interests. When you have a 40% gap in the data, it's really worth talking about that. So that's the data. We found that action research is the best way to move collective teacher efficacy. And so that's why we use the process that we do. Then you add the student voice piece on top of the adults, and you get what was discovered when people from Clemson University studied our program. It's my favorite research finding. <laughs> it's not numbers. Clemson said, geez, when you put a group of diverse kids together, they collect data, they share that information from, from their point of view to, with all their teachers, and they talk about what they believe works and doesn't work in their school, and those adults sit at the table with the kids. We observed after three years, it just brings out the best in the grown-ups. Did you ever go to a meeting with teachers or adults with no kids around, and then you went to another meeting of the same people with kids around, the behavior, the energy, the positivity is completely different sometimes in those teacher meetings in those rooms. So Clemson said when kids are at the table with adults, it brings out the best in the adults, and that's that, that adult culture piece that we're trying to get at. So by doing school improvement with students as partners, thank you for being a student representative. That's and why we keep that around. That's what I was going to say. Sorry. <laughs> Um, what we need to do is give you data, we need to give you lo a lot of tools, leadership training, to be able to use your voice in as, as powerful a way as you can, and other students as well. Come on. Why doesn't this work? So that's the Clemson finding. When students and adults were at the table together, it brought out the best in the adults. We have qualitative data too, um, not just numbers, not just surveys, but we have two questions at the end. What are one or two things that work best for you as a student or a person at this school? People write books. They write, write and write and write and write, the things they love, the same stories we're hearing here. We get dozens and dozens and dozens of those stories of the things that everybody's doing well. It's so positive, it's so, it's so exciting. And then the second question is, what are, what are one or two things you would like to see changed about the school to make it work better for you or other students like you? We get incredible insights into the things that need work from those qualitative data. So the, the YPAR process, very quickly, is we select that diverse team of students. We uh, select a team of adults that really care about this work, that are willing to work with them. We then train them to do their um, 
data anal their data collection. That's their first big action project. Oh, by the way, this happens, I didn't know if just if you mentioned we do this with third grade through 12th grade, so elementary, middle, or high. So depending upon what schools you want, the elementary stuff is amazing to watch these kids do this work. Um, so they analyze their, their data, and then they set three goals for improvement, and then they create what we call sweet spot action projects. And um, I think what I'll do, Justin, if it's okay, is I'll send you just a link to, we just did a conference at New England College, the New Hampshire Youth Voice Conference with all our teams. And we just compiled a list of all the action projects that they come up with when they're working on school violence prevention, anti-bullying, making teaching and learning more engaging for more kids, uh, whatever the goals are. They create these incredible projects that, um, that are just inspiring for people and they make people cry when they see how cool they are. <laughs> but they get everybody's attention and that's the whole point. So they create the action projects and then they continue to work over a two year period. That's the point, we collect the data, we analyze the data, those kids work for about a year and a half on their action projects. At the end of the second year we do a post test and we get to actually see the things that change in terms of safety respect. So it's a data driven uh, model. Um, this is what the, this is kids, this is elementary school students, notice the data. You, would you say that school is mostly positive, mostly negative, or sort of in between? Green is good. Green is 80% positive or higher. We just code the numbers. So green is good. There's not much red there. That is 50% or below said something positive. And so they use the red and the yellow to set goals, but sometimes they'll use the green, and we encourage them to do a lot of projects that are just building on the positives, building on the assets that the school already has. So the data in your packet, and this gets to what is school climate and culture, I think if you just reflect on the conversation you've had, you'll see the topics that you've talked about tonight already represented. Schools, perceptions of school safety, perceptions of school discipline and student supports, respectful relationships, teacher-student, student-teacher, teacher-teacher, uh, teaching and learning, the classroom climate inside the classroom, not just the hallways, not just the bus, not just the playground. Level of student engagement, uh, we heard that wonderful story about how engaged these, these kids are in these activities. Kids love to learn when we do it right. And then uh, the whole idea of student voice, that's what this whole process is. It's about student voice. And we bring student voice to you by making it into data. So you can really look at what student voice looks like and, and decide what's important. And then the adult culture piece, we look at the extent to which the adults collaborate. Teacher efficacy, the extent to which teachers feel like the things they do work. How many teachers are doubting themselves these days? And we know when teachers are confident, they feel eff efficacious or effective, they're much stronger. But then that last one is collective efficacy. How do we work effectively as a team together? Everything I just described, raise your hand if you've done a master's degree in education. Everybody, let's see. What was your capstone project? Did you do an action research project for your capstone? Most. Well, actually, I'm not going to <laughs> <laughs> well, most, people, most teachers, <laughs> most teachers who did, they did their masters. They did this process for their master's degree. So when you have third, fourth, fifth graders doing grad work, it gets the teacher's attention a little bit. Like those little kids are doing what I did for my master's degree. So they're a little more likely to go. You know what? You can miss my class to go work on the student leadership team once a month or every two weeks because we know you're learning a whole bunch of stuff in the process. Um, academic connections, uh, this is one case study, but um, probably the most powerful project we've been involved in was 36 schools in Sullivan County, Tennessee, four high schools, eight middle schools. They worked under the consent decree of the U.S. Department of Justice because this was the culture in those high schools. Boys were grabbing African-American boys for years. You said the, the, the weeds have been going on for 20 years. This tradition in this high school was going on for 20 years. They were doing mock lynchings of African-American kids in the high school, and the grown-ups didn't know about it. And they got sued by families, and they lost big time. And we were the punishment 
<laughs> Imagine us going down to Tennessee, working on this incredibly dangerous, racist situation. If we had gone in there with any other process than this one, they would have run us out of town on a rail. But what we did was we just said, here, let's, let's try to collect data on what the teachers say is happening, what the kids say is happening, what the parents say is happening. Hold up that mirror, see what we like, see what we don't like, and make movement. It was a four-year consent decree from the U.S. Department of Justice. <coughs> they let them off a year early because they made such really successful progress in changing the climate and the culture in those 36 schools. They were about to quit the program when the superintendent put their academic achievement data up. Their climate and culture data went like this. Their academic achievement data paralleled. It was an 11% increase in academic achievement. They had never seen that kind of improvement. You can't learn when the kind of stuff that you're describing of being scared and being having a dangerous setting, you can't learn in that environment. And so we just have to get that cleaned up and learning can happen and that's what we do. So I'll stop there, but thank you all so much. I went over, Je I'm sorry, I was a little long. It's okay. <laughs> And again, we're, we're looking to engage with this organization at the middle and the high school levels um, to start that work here in the fall with the, with the student action research teams. And one of the things they will do is they will come back and report out all their stuff, their goals, they'll report out their action projects to you. That's part of their <coughs> leadership role. Um, and so your student representative will have some company, uh, people presenting to you a lot, I hope, if that happens. So thank you all so much. I'm happy to answer questions, but I know we've got to move on. No, three. Oh, sorry. Go, no, go ahead. Um, so I was just wondering what the response rate you get on the surveys are. Yeah. I tell you one thing, it's changed since COVID. Um, in, uh, well, so, we, so we, we, we're doing surveys right now in Litchfield, in their elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, we just saw their numbers coming through. We had about, so far, we still have makeups to do and stuff for the rest of this week. We had about 63, 64% so far. Which is not, you know, when we used to do this prior to, prior to COVID, we would almost immediately get almost 80 right off the bat. So there's a reason why kids are opting out. I don't know what it is, but they're less inclined to do our surveys than they were. We do have the qualitative data, though, and we get incredible rich descriptions of what the numbers mean from that. And when we, when we find stuff that we're unsure of, the first thing that the student leadership team does is they do this thing called a restorative circle where let's say there's information here from only, let's say it's only 55% of the students fill it out. If we get really powerful information, we want to know, like, why do the kids say that the school is unsafe or kids aren't taking safety seriously? What does that mean? Their first action, I was in Littleton yesterday, their action project around safety is they're just convening a representative group of kids to talk about why did the teachers, 19% of the teachers said kids are taking safety issues seriously. 19% of the teachers and 14% of the kids said that their peers are taking school safety seriously. I don't know what that means. So we're going to do these focus groups to find out what the heck's going on and why, what can the school do differently to have kids take this stuff more seriously. So, so it's not just a one shot on the data. We, we try to make sure that we have results that we feel are trustworthy. The, I think, I, didn't, I don't know if I sent it to you, but there's, the instrument's been validated, Cronbach's alpha scores for every one of those things, and so there's validity and reliability to the survey. And so that, we know that it's reliable. We know it's a matter of sampling, so. And then just a um, quick question. It said K to 12 on the slides, but you said third grade does. You're not gonna make me tell you my K my K3 data collection story, are you? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did it yesterday real quick. Kindergarten kids, teachers say, what are four areas where school climate is happening? On the bus, in the playground, <coughs> in the hallways, um, in the classroom. The teachers have their kids draw four pictures. This is me on the bus, this is me on the playground, this is me. And then the high school and middle school leadership team goes in, sits with them, and they say, tell me what's in that picture. And then they code it with a green sticker if it's a positive story about the bus, a red sticker if it's a negative. So we actually are able to get quantitative data from picture drawing from the little kids. It's, it's great stuff. And you said you do um, evaluations after a two or four year time? We, we try to get it done as soon if we get started in the fall. We'll, their first action project is data collection. It takes a while to get it started. We usually have data by October, November. 
and then they work all the way until the next spring on their action projects. We post test in like April. We work around test testing in the spring the next year. Do you always test the same group of students so that um, we test all students and any kid who's willing to do the survey it's a passive permission form so kids just assent to do it but the way we get the participation rate up is this it's the survey is not done by the superintendents not by the principal it's done by the student leadership team they make a video introducing themselves as a leadership team working on climate and culture and the first thing we're asking our peers to do is take this survey seriously we know kids sometimes blow it off and they promise the student body they will bring the data back to them. Kids never see the results of the surveys, so they promise they'll bring the data back, and we, that's why we get a better return rate. Kristen, did you have something? Oh, no, did you have one more? Last, I promise. Yeah, go ahead. And then my last one was, um, can you say you actually um, see a, ch I, you probably can't say, but is it in a change in the climate or the change in perception? Huh, interesting. This gets a little philosophical, because what is climate? Climate is when you walk in, you feel something, right? <coughs> you feel safe, you feel unsafe, you feel respected, you feel it's fun. <coughs> it's all perception. But what we know is it has neurological implications. If you walk in and you're afraid, your brain is kicking out chemicals that are keeping you from your fight or flight. Yeah. You're not ready to learn. So I think it's all perception. Sorry. I know we're starting with the middle school and the high school, but I've heard repeatedly about the elementary. Is are we going to go to that level at some point? Is that a thought or? It's I mean it's discussions that we're certainly having. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, the high schools are hardest. Middle school kids eat this stuff up. They are so fabulous as leaders. They just get so into it and they really do incredible work. High school kids, it takes a little while to get them in the groove of it because they kind of don't believe sometimes that adults are going to really listen to them at that point after 11 years in the system or whatever. So um, we love we love raising them up from elementary and they, they hit that middle school and they're like ready to go. And by the time they get to high school, they're like seasoned veteran leaders. They know how to do it. So we, but starting at the middle school is fine. Most schools do that. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank Sorry you. I went long. No, Sorry. thank you very thank much. You thank you for all the thank information. You, thank you. Next up is the NEASC school accreditation. So the NEAS accreditation, um, I know there was a, lots of documents shared with this board. It was a board request of you. Uh, Jen is here with us to kind of break down all of that information that you got and <coughs> kind of walk us through a little summary of it. Thank you, Jen. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm just waiting for Dean's assistance. No, <laughs> I don't know so much about this presentation, so I don't think that would be so good. <laughs> That's yours. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Go for it. To move it forward. Okay. Oh, that worked. <laughs> okay. This needs a double click. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Jim Bohopek. I'm the secondary curriculum coordinator, and I've been invited tonight to talk a little bit about our NEASC process. Um, I've been leading the NEAS process for about five-ish years now, and so I'm excited to just share with you some of the work that we've done. As you said in your packets, I think there's a lot of information there. This is just a brief overview just to kind of give you some general information and start to kind of wrap your head around what we've done in the past five years. Um, and if you have any questions at the end, be happy to answer some. So if you're not familiar with it, NEASC is the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll try to keep going here. Um, NEASC is an independent nonprofit organization, and we work with them voluntarily. They work with several schools, they partner with over 1,500 schools, some public, some private, even some universities. And it supports us through our accreditation process. It helps us 
uh, find areas of improvement and growth. And, um, and for us, it's been a really valuable experience to show us some of the great things that we knew we were doing, but they've highlighted a lot for us. And so it feels good to kind of bring some value to that when the teams come to visit. NIASC has seven standards that they put out where we have several indicators within each standard to try to speak to those areas of our work that we do at the high school. Um, core values and beliefs about learning really revolves around mission and goals, and then curriculum, instruction, assessment, pretty straightforward, school culture and leadership, school resources, and then extending to the community resources that we use for learning. So those are the, the big seven, and then there's several indicators underneath. So this process that I wanted to share with you tonight goes back to 2018-2019 school year, and that's sort of like the cycle that we are in right now. That's when this started for us. We completed a year-long self-study where we had the entire staff broken up into groups to help us with the process, and they worked really hard to prepare reports and gather evidence and help us analyze those seven areas that NIASC puts out. At the same time, we were preparing the budget for the fall visitation that was going to take place in 2019. So that November, NIASC came to visit us, and that was, thank you, um, 13 committee members came, their educators from all over New England, and they stayed with us from Sunday evening until Wednesday afternoon. Sunday evening, we put on a big, big presentation. They got to meet several of our student groups and organizations and sports groups. They met with teachers. And then Monday through Wednesday, they stayed in our building and interviewed groups of students, staff, administrative teams. They shadowed students, so they actually went class to class and followed students through their schedules and analyzed the reports and the evidence that we had put together through the self-study. So then at the end of that, they come up with a team report from their organization that reports out on their findings, basically. And so they provide for us a list of commendations and recommendations, and then that kind of carries us through the next part of the process. The reports, because I was so close to the work, I feel like the reports kind of fall a little flat because we had so many compliments from them when they were here. We were so proud of our students and our staff, and there's great things, certainly, that are said within the reports, but just speaking from the personal experience, it was awesome to be able to talk with those people one-on-one -on -one and hear some of their um, genuine comments about how amazing our students were and our staff was and what great work we had been doing. So. I know that a lot of that is in there, but I have to throw that in because it definitely doesn't feel like it bounces off the page to me like it did when I was living it and um, meeting them and, and getting to know them over those three days. Okay, so then that carries us through to the 21-22 school year, and that's the year that we worked on the two-year progress report. So that's basically like the first report that we put together post the visitation in the fall of 2019. And so that um, took place with us writing a series of narratives where we <coughs> responded to the recommendations that they provided out of that 2019 visit. And they take that information and then give us an updated version of commendations and recommendations. And then that populates the work that we do or we did this year in the 22-23 school year and what we plan to do next year in the 23-24 school year. So what came out of that two-year progress report, we wrote narratives to about half of the recommendations from that report. And then next year we'll work on the five-year report and respond to about half a little more than half in that two-year report okay. and so this just lists for you the commendations from the two-year progress report you also have that either in your packet or it has been sent to you online um, there's so many amazing things that they have to say but 
I guess I wanted to just sort of highlight that we have so many great things going on in different areas of our work. It's not like they found one strength of ours in one area that we put a lot of effort into. Like I was very pleased with the fact that we have done so many different things over the years and they've recognized us in so many different areas of their standards. So I think that's really awesome. It just kind of shows how well-rounded we are as a high school. and. Um, Another thing that you might see is how some of the commendations kind of turn into recommendations, which I sort of appreciate because it, it, it brings to light how you don't really engage in work as a one and done and things can kind of turn over and grow years later. And so one example of that is how we've been working towards our competency-based grading and reporting that we started when we wrote the curriculum in 2015, really. But that's grown and grown over the years. And so, you know, they recognize that as a commendation, but then they also put it in as a recommendation, continue that work. Now grow your rubrics, revise your rubrics, do more in the reporting out area. So you'll see that that kind of is visited in um, a few of the reports and, you know, will carry through. And to me, that's sort of a positive because they recognize we're doing it well and want us to keep the work going. So the special progress report is what we worked on this year, and that's where we responded to half of that two-year progress report recommendation list. And so those are the five that we spoke to this year, submitted that, and we'll, I think, hear back from them. Um, I'm not sure if they'll provide us feedback based on these narratives or if they'll wait until our five-year report is done, since that will wrap up all of the recommendations. Um, but this work is now done and we're looking forward to the five-year report that we'll do next year to respond to these things. And so again, I feel like it covers a lot of different areas of our work, but just kind of revisiting that same idea, you know, we've been working on our competency-based grading and reporting and rubric development, and so that's, again, something that we're going to continue to work on and talk about in our five-year progress report, even though it was a commendation from our visitation in 2019. And that is all I have to share with you tonight. I know that there was a lot of information that was given to you ahead of time, but this was just to kind of um, help you understand a little bit about the organization and their purpose and the work that we have done at the high school through the accreditation process and what we have coming up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions? Just one. Um, my understanding is that the goal is that at the end of five years, all these things that are in progress, you'll be able to write down, complete it. And, uh, and that, that creates a little bit of pressure. You know, but but um, you can see how much work has gone into this and how relevant it is and how consistent it is with all the other things that we're uh, being presented with. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the information. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Jen. Next elementary enrollment update. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> this summary for some of you will look familiar. It's an update from the summary I gave last month. Um, for those of you who are seeing this for the first time, these are um, our current projected numbers as of the 14th. Um, can tell you that those numbers are slightly different today, um, but not drastic, <laughs> drastically different, but they are different. Um, and so we are constantly monitoring um, both our new registrations and students who are withdrawing and entering in our grades uh, even this month. I did add for you, um, I, I kept the, um, where we're pushing our pressure points as we always call them where we're pushing and those are the ones that we are the most concerned about right now and and following the closest um, but we do have several class classrooms or grade levels on watch um, those are uh, grade levels that have 
we don't anticipate, based on historical information, we don't anticipate that those are going to go over before the end of the year. Um, but certainly, as we look through the summer at registration, um, we could get to maximum capacity. But based on the number of students that that would take, whether that be six or seven total, those are more watchable. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, just, just again, we're just watching. We're Sorry. crossing Every our day. fingers and hoping <laughs> there's no recommendations as of right now other than just continue to keep an eye on it right now. Yes. Thank you. When are you coming back? <laughs> what, are you coming back? Two weeks. Two, I mean, <laughs> it's okay. two weeks? I mean, or... Yeah. Is, I mean, it's every two weeks. Okay, that sounds good. Next is red shirting. So, <laughs> how are we on that? As far as how many do we have requests for red shirting so far? I guess your numbers and so I think the board wanted to open up a conversation about red shirting t tonight, and Sandy and I were going to be here just to op open ourselves any any questions that you have and as much information that we could provide around around that area. Um, it kind of just to define that term, it kind of means when a student is coming into kindergarten um, at not kind of a, an age defined uh, area, and it's usually at a parental request. Um, so there has been a practice, at least uh, within the last few years. Um, that the board has entertained some of those things and they have approved, if not every single one that's come before them, most of them. Uh, and there just seems to be some um, challenges that we would like to bring forward to ask you folks to think about, uh, but also to have the, uh, the chance for the board to have a larger conversation about how they're feeling about it. Now we're directly in that time. They tie to the numbers that Lucy just kind of showed you as we're trying to make those decisions and make sure that we are well staffed uh, and that we are given priority to age appropriate students. Um, but we're unique in that we've got four towns and we've got some flexibility with how that works sometimes. So um, certainly wanted to make ourselves available to answer anything factually that we can that helps you to potentially inform your decisions down the road uh, specific to this topic. So I know you just gave the definition. Maybe I just spaced when you said it. So the red charting, just for new people on the board, is when you have a kid in a a child that's eligible to go into first grade, but the parents are asking for them to stay in kindergarten and do one more year of kindergarten for whatever reasons they may be. So the numbers that we see here, potential red shirts, are they in with first grade here or are they in with where parents are requesting them to be? Okay. They're in with the kindergarten numbers. Right now we only have two requests across the district. This is going to be okay. 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 We only have two. Same numbers we're looking at. Yeah. So they're not driving numbers right now? Or, or are they, that's what I'm looking at the watch and Sandy, did you? So let me ask a question if you don't, well, can I ask one? Um, is there a situation where parents want to redshirt the child but the teachers think that that's not in the best interest of them? I mean, you, you kind of have two very expert, in my humble opinion, two expert opinions the, the staff and the teachers and the parents and I would ask myself why would a parent request that if it wasn't in the best if they didn't see their child struggling or they didn't think it was he or she was ready um, does there ever come a time where a teacher says oh no you know he should be in the th or she should be in the third grade I, I, I would find it hard to believe that that situation exists but just just to clarify it sorry I don't know if you can hear me um, this process that we've had in place that um, Mrs. Canotis worked really um, hard on this putting a process together um, last year with our elementary team um, when parents make that request they initiate the request to the school officials um, they then are put in touch with um, there's a Google form that they're sent to provide additional information about their request. They also have an opportunity to communicate around some research around um, the idea of redshirting. And mm -hmm. over time, um, 
research behind either advantages, if that stabilizes. So they get a series of research. There's, um, they look at academic data as well as other data on the child to determine mm -hmm. if it would be advantageous for them or not. The um, and there's a recommendation that's made to the family. So in some cases, and we also have to consider space, but there is a process that revolves two-way communication between the family and the schools. I would think, as Dawn would tell you, um, a, a, a meeting with the parents and staff. I mean, I remember, you know, you have a guidance counselor, the principal, the teacher, whomever is involved with the parents and sit down and have a, you know, 20 minutes over what's in the best interest of the student. Does that take place? There, yes. So once the parents complete that form, mm -hmm. that process is initiated and there is a recommendation that's made from um, the curriculum team. They review a series of information. They make a, make a recommendation and then the parents um, are informed through the superintendent's office. They get a letter based on the recommendation and what their options might be. At that point, they can then come back, as happened last spring, for those of you who were on the board last spring. Um, there were some families who did come back to the board in June to petition the board um, with regard to allowing their children to repeat. So, Sandy, yes. can I just clarify? Yep. Um, when we consider students as academic... <laughs> <laughs> Just stay there. <laughs> when we consider the request an academic redshirt, they're students we don't currently have in our district. So mm -hmm. they haven't yet come to school. If they were in kindergarten and they were asking to stay, that would be a retention. <laughs> so we hand, handled them slightly different, yeah. okay. uh, even though it's a similar process. Yeah. Because usually what this situation is, correct me if I'm wrong, is as you said, it's kids that have been somewhere else in preschool or kindergarten or whatever and the parents are holding them to try to get that extra year because they don't feel like they're ready to go into first grade so they want them to come in when they're either going to be six and they're going to be the age where we by law have to provide full day these children have to be enrolled full day so if they turn six during the year or whatnot we have to provide them full day so they have to be in that full day kindergarten which we don't offer for everybody and, and that also is a tuition based situation. So there are other factors that go into this other than just, you know, you. placement. So and then we have to look at our numbers that if we already have full kindergarten, so if we have what's our kindergarten class number? I mean it, enrollment 20. capacity or twenty. 20. It's or twenty. 20. So yeah. if we have twenty kids that are actual kindergarten age and we have somebody that wants to red shirt and it's going Bumps you over the we floor. have to consider all of these factors that go into place and then so last year when we had the conversation we had parents that came in um, and basically what our, our decision to them was because they were in the impression that they could do this and you know from from where they had been we ended up allowing that with the understanding that we told these parents it's going to depend on the space of this the school that you want to be in because if we don't have the space we can't yeah. we can't go hire another teacher for that because you, those children have to be in full day. Right. They have to be, but we also said part of the deal was they have to realize they have to pay that full tuition for the year. So you follow, so I by know, law we have, to give the, we have to give the education, I, but if they were choosing to pull them back, I, we were I, saying that they were responsible for the tuition for the year. I, I follow you. I, the only thing I, I think is, I think that I get a little bit frustrated listening to is if you're at 20 and it bops you over to 21 and that student should really be registered and you don't have the room to put to facilitate that it's almost like the child is the one bearing the burden for lack of a better term um, it's a tough situation but so we, I, I understand. we also I believe had offered different I mean they might not be able to go to their school of their choice no I, but, I mean if they were choosing the red shirt they could have Found, gone to one of the other schools in the district that had the space because we have to. No, I understand. I, understand. I know. I'm doing, so I'm just. So where do we stand with all of? I mean, numbers wise, with the the requests that we have, are we okay? We're not going to bump over the share. I mean, because the numbers are in here. You said they're in here, right? But we're we're on told pressure points. I know she did <laughs> tell you to stay. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. Lucy. Um, we do have one request at Atkinson, which is a pressure point. Um, we have 44 interested parties as of when I wrote the report. That means um, they filled out the online registration saying we would like full day. We do not have all 44 who have finalized because we gave until April 30th to finalize in order to decide on how many classes we were running. 
So technically, right, that the red shirt within that 44, we still, we're already four students over requesting for the two classes that we have. So we are likely, if people finalize their registration, going to need to add that class. Um, the other request is at Sandown Central. That is also a pressure point. However, um, there are 46 requests for full day, including the one request for red shirt, and we have three classes already. So it's a pressure point for different reasons, not for that okay. full day. Bree? Uh, just to clarify, can you only red shirt kindergarten? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank how, you. How many requests do we typically get for red shirts? This would seem. Like Last year we had eight. Okay, so it's not a big number. No, but it was six at one school, which right. was where we were um, looking at the space availability. Okay, and, you, and Kristen, you had said that there could be an option to not maybe go to Sandown, but go to. Danville, if that's really yeah, what well, that's to. that's what we had talked about. Mm -hmm. is, is so if we had an overflow to school, or basically saying we have to put in the certain the kids that do already qualify naturally by their their birth year that aren't redshirted, if we filled the classes that way first, that their option was then to if they want to do it again, and these children can go on to first grade. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can, but if the parents still feel that they shouldn't, is to then find another location within the mm -hmm. district that would have an opening, but that would fall. As we explained, that that falls on the parents to provide the transportation because we can offer first grade for these children, you know, but they're choosing to hold them back for a year. So that was the key is to say, if you're going to do this, you have to, if you're not in your district, you might have to find transportation. And again, whether you're in your district or not, you have to commit to be paying the full tuition right. for the year. And we fill with traditional students, uh, for lack of a better term, non-red shirt, right up to the registration time before the red shirts are considered? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that, okay. And then just one, uh, just on that, Jack, you had asked about a meeting with the parents and then I might have heard it wrong. And then you said a letter is sent. There's communication as well. There, there's a back and forth. Um, Not a meeting with the parents. In some cases, there were individual meetings last year. I'm looking to Lucy. There were multiple cases last year. This year, there's just the two. Um, so. Okay. Yeah, so that many. And, then, and if they don't like it, they can come speak to us yep. or whatever. Yes. They right. mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. By definition, would we consider a student to be redshirted if they, uh, if their teacher, and or in collaboration with their parent, determined that the child was not ready to move on for social reasons or whatever, that it was their recommendation to you know give the child a little mm -hmm. bit more exposure mm -hmm. on that lower level. Would that student still, by definition, be considered a red shirt? Well, it's a different it would be recommendation. A retention. Yeah. yeah. What's yeah. that? It would be a retention. So if we're, if we're holding a student back in a grade for a second year, then they all fall under retention. Okay, so, so it's really the not, difference it, of that would yeah. not be considered a red shirt because no, I would not right. want a situation Correct. That would, where yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. That would they were priority, priority hours over. and exactly. we had knowledge of the student. If the student were yes. coming from an outside, not ours, a uh, private pre-K, right. uh, and the recommendation was, hey, this child for you know social, emotional, you know, uh, educational reasons should be held back. Do we take that outside uh, recommendation with equal weight? Uh, well, it would still be part of the red shirt process because it's it's a parent request. Um, so what I'm saying is, if the existing preschool teachers right. at a private school, mm -hmm. say in right. Hampstead, uh, said, yep. "Yeah, this child's not quite ready yet," but the parents decided, you know, they they want them in district, would that child be considered a red shirt? So, so it, weighing out outside teachers. Yeah, no, I, no, I understand yeah, what yeah. you're saying. It's all parent requests because we don't have releases to communicate about students with private orga organizations. So essentially, that is what happens in almost all these cases, right? Okay. The, the preschool teacher has spoken to the parent, advocated, they've made a decision, they've held the student right at that school, whether that's some students do two years of pre-K, some students might do pre-K and K at a private school, and then they want to do kinder they want to attend kindergarten with us. So that conversation happens, but it is the parent 
who reaches out. It's the parent who fills out the form. Last year, we did have a, um, a, a much more thorough process with, as Sandy was speaking to, um, meetings. We offered to evaluate students um, academically and behaviorally, socially. Um, we did have parents come in. They brought paperwork and, and evidence of where the student was from their schools. Um, this year, we've continued the process of asking all the same questions, and I have communicated with the families asking questions. We do offer the same things, but we haven't required parents to come in for a meeting. Um, it really, we're, as we get closer to that April 30th date, as most of you know, this is the first year that we've followed that practice of collecting a deposit to finalize registration. So um, we're really kind of looking at it as a as we get to that April 30th date. We have a lot more information this year to go off of, um, and we'll make decisions space wise based on what we know at that point. Do we ever offer the um, switching of schools to the norm like? Non red shirt <laughs> students to make that room if, say, their family said, Oh, you know what? I wouldn't mind going to Atkinson Academy to be part of this lovely garden show and <laughs> something <laughs> like that. Um, is that ever offered to make that room and not force it to be those red shirt students? That's a good question. I think it's kind of that the people who are on the right, who are on the Age appropriate track should get first precedence because those people who are are again optional if they yeah. want. I don't know to do that it. would be a uh, in my experience, um, I've never encountered a need to do that. Um, but it would certainly be the superintendent's discretion. Okay. So right now I, I know this says information on action, but is there any it's no action required right now. There's no with two requests. I was going to say with two requests, there's no action. So we better to have. <laughs> you're coming back in two weeks, anyways, right? <laughs> so I'm just if April 30th is the the registration deadline per se. So we should have a better idea, or I mean, what do you? So I, I think the challenge and what I think we wanted to share with the board was like that the challenge is just about timing and timing across all aspects. It's timing about <coughs> when the request is made. There's a timing that may have a financial impact to the district down the road when we look at class size and by policy if we needed to move and get more more staff to staff those classrooms. Um, but there's also a, a, a potential cost for like the hiring process and how people get connected and embedded in their schools as staff because if we're really kids can register for school right up until the day school begins and you could have a situation where you are now three four or five over the day before school starts or the day school started and then we're in a situation where we've made commitments to families red shirts and not so this is your school this is your teacher this will be your home for the next you know five five school years and we may be in a position where we need to be calling some families and, and I, either asking them to move um, or coming to the board and looking for more staff to staff those exemptions that, that we've kind of put ourselves into. So we just wanted to raise it here and we wanted you guys to be aware of, of those challenges that's kind of presents itself. Um, but again, it's all really around timing. And again, it's a fiscal piece, it's a resident piece for the, for the families, and it's a hiring, a hiring challenge as well. Any other questions? All right. <clears throat> Special education. I wanted to do the city golf again. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy's job. There's no question. <laughs> I think it was misplaced. Thank you, everyone. So for some of you I know, but some of you I don't know. So I'm Kelly Brooks. I'm the director of Special Ed. This is my second year. Um, here I had the privilege of working with Mr. Woodworth my first year um, at the high school as a coordinator. Um, he taught me a lot. So uh, in your packet you should have um, kind of a bulleted um, of what we've been doing and uh, what we are planning on doing. So I um, <coughs> can say that my first year with Mr. Woodworth, uh, we did not have a director that year. So last year was um, making up for what we didn't have the year before and um, for my first year. So we um, uh, collected, and by we, I mean, um, I have special ed administrators that work with me. So we have uh, Amy Daly, who's at the elementary level, Don Roberson, who's at the middle school level, and Ricky Chauvin, who's at the high school level. 
So um, this year, uh, after collecting a lot of information, um, we ended up putting a lot of things in place. So we've been working with the Center for uh, New England Center for Children to look at um, evaluating our students that have ASD and what we can offer for services if we want to move forward with the program. Um, previously in the district, you did have ASD programs, so they kind of went away. So we have had a pretty um, good, comprehensive look at children, talking with case managers, talking with um, administrators, looking at the kids. So that's one thing. The next one is we recognize that there are students that have emotional disabilities in the district. And you did have ED programs, and they went away. So we have been looking at that. We've been working with Eric Mann this year to look at criteria, look at students, look at resources, look at how we can support kids that have those. Um, the next thing is, um, some of it is about our paperwork. So uh, we have a lot of paperwork that we send home to parents, a lot of reports, a lot of IEPs, a lot of uh, information. We now have a process where we look and read all of those. So um, I'm covering the high school right now, so I read all of their <coughs> IEPs, their reports, um, WPNs, anything that goes out to parents, I've seen it, I give approval, and it goes out. That's partly because we want to catch a lot of things, any errors or any of those things. So that is a process that's in place this year. The other thing is, is our documents and timeline. We're required to have documents out in a certain amount of uh, time. We now have that timeline. It's very clear for our staff when they need to have documents out. I'm not going to say we're 100% perfect um, because things happen, but we map it out when you know day 45 is, when day 15 is, whatever, for when they need to send information um, out. Um, this year, we um, had the great opportunity to have a district-wide um, CPI or de-escalation training, so every staff member, paraprofessionals and professional staff, regular ed and special ed, attended that. So we talked about how you dysregulate, how you help kids that are escalated with behavior, how you are able to bring them um, down. So that was great. Um, on top of that, we have sent um, uh, staff members to be trained. So every building now has a trainer in it. Secondary, we have two people that can go between um, three buildings. But now if you have a new staff member that comes in, if you need to add to your crisis team, it isn't, oh, I need to call Kelly and see what her schedule is and if she can come out. We have someone right in your building which has really, really been great. Um, we had, um, interestingly enough, you have certain people that are trained in certain buildings to do programs. So if you were in uh, Atkinson, you might be able to have, or in Gillingham. But if you're in Pollard, you couldn't have it because we didn't have a staff member. So we're now branching out. I, I, I know it sounds odd, but um, we now are, are branching out and doing it across the district. So. Reading programs are a cross for intervention. It's not just one person that takes it and they do it. You know, it, it sounds very logical, right, that we would have that across the district, but um, for whatever reason, there wasn't that thought. So we have been working really, really hard on um, doing that. Um, the other thing is the time study, which I can say people did not like, um, uh, but there's a lot of information that is garnered from that. That is a week of time that they record exactly what they have done. So from that, we review every single staff member's time study. What do we see? You know, what are we um, seeing for services? What are we seeing for absences? What are we seeing for the um, resources that we have? Allocation of staff. Uh, we worked this year with um, the curriculum group and the administrators. We all worked together, went through it and really identified, had some really good conversations about what's going on in your building. You know, where could you use people? What could you move people and um, help in your building instead of just saying, I have this person and they're only going to do this. We actually looked um, at those. Um, Susan Fitzel is coming in and doing a co-teaching training with us, which is gonna be really exciting. Uh, everybody who attends that will become trainers, then we can go out and train our other people. So that's, I'm in a classroom, it could be a special ed with a regular ed, it could be a regular ed with a regular ed. Um, for any of us, like myself, I've done um, co-teaching, never did a training, came naturally, not everybody comes naturally to them. So we're excited about doing that. Um, the other thing is expanded um, behavior support across the district. So obviously we have identified that that is a need and um, we have expanded it across. So. 
Um, previously, some of our behavior support was in one school and not everywhere. Um, so now we've put it across um, the uh, district. Medicaid uh, training for all staff. We um, have to write IEPs the correct way to be able to bill Medicaid, to be able to get the money. Um, there is certain language that we're supposed to have, and we have not had that. So we, um, and we just got selected for a Medicaid audit, so good timing. <laughs> 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 so um, we uh, now are able to do those, um, the writing in the IEPs and stuff. We have one more training left to do. Um, the other thing we're doing right now is really trying to figure out how we can bill um, with in-house. So you have a student that maybe in district um, is $100,000. Before we hadn't been billing for them, now we can bill for them. It's just creating invoices to generate more money to come back to the district. Um, one of the things I, I will say that I've enjoyed this year is working with the admin team and being able to kind of dive into some of the things that are happening. We had the LEA determination, which I shared at one point, and we were need um, identified as needing intervention. We have met, we put plans together, we've been working collaboratively. We just barely were notified that we are now on assistant, which is great. We're, we're moving up, which is exactly the direction that we want to go in. Um, one set of forms across the district. I know that is, again, another thing that we should have had, but I can't tell you how many times I get things for Beth Rincon. You know, she hasn't been here for a number of years, right? I, I don't know if I could send it to her. Maybe she would approve it. <laughs> she might. She might. Um, but um, just having one form, you know, across the district is very helpful for um, all of us so that we know exactly what we're filling out very easy um, meetings at the elementary level to be able to have more instructional time were put at the beginning and end um, in previous years they blocked out a day to have their meetings you can imagine what happens for a child that needs to have five days a week of service when you don't have because you have meetings so now they're at the end of the days it's not ideal we know we need to look at it um, with um, Lucy and stuff you know we need to take and, and look because there are times that it doesn't work out but these are really good opportunities for our kids to have solid time for instruction. Um, and then the other thing is um, we're moving to an encryption system where all our reports will go out to parents um, passworded. Instead of right now, which happens by email, you send it out. Uh, many people who are in outside agencies know it's everything's encrypted that comes into us. We just are coming up with the times and moving forward and, and having those for privacy protection for us. So that's what we've done this year. There's a lot of other things that we have done um, this year. When I was looking over it, again, I'm like, oh, we did this, we did that. Just know that we are tackling a lot of things in the district to be able to figure out what we can do across the district and everybody can be a part of instead of these little silos of whatever is going on. Um, next year, we have big plans for next year. Uh, professional development is something that we definitely know that we need to do. And, um, and people want to do it. So, you know, areas of behavior management, writing measurable <coughs> goals, um, data collection, legal updates, um, and other areas. There's many other areas that we need to do. But professional development can't be limited to just the special ed staff. We really need to have regular ed be a part of that, too. Um, the um, ASC uh, program partnership, we're moving forward with that for next year. We um, should have the report the first week in May to be able to bring to the board. Um, the, uh, we'll work with New England Center. Um, the ED program um, has been established at the elementary level. The elementary administrators we have met, identified um, the criteria, identified um, possible students for it, and we will move forward uh, with that. The middle and high school is a little bit behind because it's a schedule kind of issue and how to make it uh, work, how to make it accessible. We really want our kids in the regular ed as much as possible, but we understand that they may not be able to tolerate that. But you, with our schedules the way that they are, it's just trying to figure out staffing and how to be able to um, help them. Uh, we have already uh, been working with Landmark to look at our reading services. Uh, we 
have pockets again in different buildings of services that are being offered we really need to do something across the district to identify what it is that we're doing where we're falling um, short our numbers for special ed eligible kids are not going down um, and so with COVID it's going to only continue to go up but we need to be able to um, find out what we need to do for intervention what we need to do to help um, the students um, the other thing is is that we are really working together to identify what we can't tackle it all at once right for next year so we really need to look at what we can do what we can work collaboratively together you know how can curriculum and special ed work together and be able to it's not just um, special ed once they're eligible then then we'll take over what can we do together and, and that's something I've appreciated <coughs> this year because I know that um, I could ask Lucy about a goal that doesn't make sense to me and she will give her two cents which is very appreciated um, and I've learned a lot um, from that we are going to establish a manual for our staff so that we are all on the same page all about the processes all about the forms all about what you do you need to have a vision assessment this is what you do surprisingly we have it in a Google Drive right now um, but uh, you know you know how that works uh, some of us old timers like myself go to a binder and that seems to make it a little bit easier for me Justin's probably cringing right now thinking about all that paper but um, all this paper up here right I now. know <laughs> I know I just I thanks. sell paper for a living let's use okay that <laughs> but it's it's one place and the other thing is is that we forget when we have new people <clears throat> that we know what's going on and we we say go into the Google Drive if you can imagine being a new person in a new district and trying to navigate a system that we already know it's really really tough but you can all go back to a binder that has the information in it eventually we will get away from that um, but we have to start somewhere where everything is in one place um, we uh, have to have another plan for our LEA determination for needing assistance but um, they have been uh, gracious enough I talked to the person from the state that some of our work that we've been doing they're going to let us continue to do that because they see that we're making progress so that's better than starting um, a new one uh, data collection that is the one thing that I feel like we've talked about continuously so anybody who is in a clinical setting uh, knows how to do data like OTs are really really good or, or you know some of our other people are not so good about it and don't know the reason behind it I think our Medicaid training has helped people to understand why you have to have it uh, and uh, due process helps us understand that any legal findings helps us parents want to know they are pretty trusting about you know your your child's doing well what does that mean what is the definition of um, well uh, we will do co-teaching uh, next year we'll look at the elementary school and how we can implement um, that and ongoing Medicaid training uh, is one of the things coming out of our audit I'm sure we're going to have to continue to do so that is kind of in a nutshell there <coughs> is a lot of other things that are going on but no we're establishing programs we're going to offer professional development we're going to really analyze and try to understand what we need to do for the students um, in the district mm -hmm. um, you know, I tend to be critical of a lot of departments and a lot of people but what you folks do is absolutely incredible um, and, and I don't think until you see it firsthand can you appreciate fully what you do so uh, I'm jealous and, and I am just it, it's incredible every day and uh, it needs to be acknowledged publicly um, how hard that job is and how successful it is here within the district in my humble opinion so thank you yep there uh, we have a lot of really hard working people that um, work with some of our hard students right but they're committed um, and they want more and so I will say anything that we're offering people are gobbling up they want it sometimes not so willingly some of them uh, but they're we're pulling them along we're pretty we're pretty good have, so. you, know, have you noticed improvement with uh, parent communication with the uh, practices that you're putting in yes so um, I think the one thing about <clears throat> communication for some people it's uh, it's the amount that they don't understand so I would rather saturate 
than to assume that me emailing once or calling once is enough. I think that's really where we're kind of stuck. Some people have that, I only think that I need. I went to a meeting the other day and the parents said, can you write this? Why do we have to write that? Why can't we just contact parents? That was a natural part of my life as a special educator. I would contact because I knew the more communication that I had, the less it was gonna come back, mm -hmm. you know, to say. And that's the first thing my administrator did not wanna hear that I was not reaching out. So we need to, we need to do better. Uh, the UNH survey was very clear about that. Yes. That communication needs to improve. And so I'm assuming that you're putting things in place to improve that communication, correct? Yes. Yeah. Part of our data collection is all is all about um, logging how much we're communicating with parents. So, you know, it's it's an easier easy thing to monitor with our system that we're going to put in place. So. I have a couple things. So if anybody wants to stop me, that's fine. <laughs> Are we asking or sending out a survey to parents or considering asking how they would like to receive communication? Um, I like a phone call as a parent. Some people prefer an email. It's in writing. They feel better. I know there are some. I am a special education um, staff member. I don't always like to put things in writing because I'm always concerned about an email can become. But are we asking parents how they prefer communication, like case managers and things? Are we going to look so, at doing that as part of the process? That's something part of our process this year that we need to ask parents. How would you like to be communicated? You know, uh, email. A lot of parents are like, please just email me. Mm -hmm. um, or phone or mail we, we have some parents that kind of you know I'll pick up the folder on Friday uh, and stuff like that so we are asking that we asked the question I think it's the definition about the time like when do you call when do you email don't wait is what I can say this is your 30 for me don't wait mm -hmm. get in front of it can that be part of the manual that you're creating like to make sure you're asking parents at the beginning of the year like especially if it's a new case manager or things of that nature you know because sometimes you have a new case manager every year and you have to start all over again um, you know I, so I, that would be something I would like to see especially since it was identified in the other one and it's a part of a process that you're already putting in place um, for that um, in terms of the, the timeline for when documents are sent home to meet legal re requirements, um, we know what they are internally, but our parents need to know what they are also. Um, and I, I love those procedural safeguards that you get at every IEP meeting that are from what, 19? Uh, 2018. 2018. They updated. Okay, they <laughs> yeah, are. No. Right, the last one I got was 2012. Um, <laughs> but that can be really overwhelming and cumbersome mm -hmm. too for parents as well. So even. Um, you know, when a, a new referral is made or something like that, it, it, part of this manual, I would love to see, you know, they get a notice of exactly what dates they're expecting paperwork. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. So we have They're a, doing it internally, but the, the parents may not understand the process. Right. So we have a, something we can do to increase the communication that way. Absolutely. There's a, a flow chart, actually, that um, I think the Parent Information Center has that has, like, your, you know, how many days you should expect or whatever. So, yeah. It's something we can certainly put in there for parents to something that already exists that we can do right yeah <laughs> right and we don't have to but we'll put timberlane across the top well of yeah, yeah and say you know but yes no those are all and any suggestions that you have or whatever you know uh, my intention uh, next year is to have um, parent engagement you know so um, whether it's at night or during the day or whatever to be able to reach out to parents i am um, i can't do it right now but um, it's something that is on my, my bucket list for uh, special ed is to be able to have that. The only time I see, or most of the time I see parents right now is when they're not necessarily happy. Though today, I did have a parent that caught me in um, the driveway and was, spoke very, um, very nicely about how successful their child was and thank you for the help for last year. So that was nice to be appreciated. Well, you know. Yes, as a yeah. parent, I sat across the table from you a few days ago. Um, I, and I just had one more thing. I'm really, really thrilled to hear all of the steps that we're taking and, and the further work that you're going to continue to do. And the, the team that we have in place here at Timberland is obviously fantastic. And um, I would love to see our district be a little progressive when we're thinking about our programming in the future. 
um, and, and not be naming programs titled after a diagnosis or disability. Emotional disturbance, ASD, I would really love us to be more forward thinking um, in, in that regard because uh, a child is not the sum of their disability. So that, I just want to make that comment. I say it, I, I've written it in writing to you several times as a parent, but I think it's really important um, as we move forward as a district to be more, have more inclusive language. Right. Yeah, I think um, I put it on there because we have to go through program approval through the state, and that's what they call it. So we've already gone through the approval. I had to go through it again for us. Um, but yes, uh, no, certainly uh, I hate labels. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't. I like kids with names, and then we move on from um, there. So. Can I have a question for you about the, uh, the load that's on special education case coordinators? What, what's the average caseload that you would like to have for for them and where we stand relative to that? So our caseloads um, range, you know, between like seven um, up to 28. And um, part of that is we haven't been able to fill positions this year, unfortunately. Um, and some of the lower end are kids, are um, people that are with a specialized group of kids that, you know, I, you know, dream. <laughs> For, for me would be elementary to have a much smaller caseload so that you can really um, do that early intervention and and be able to. Middle school, you can take on a little bit more, but really, I think middle and high school, if I had a dream, it would really be between 15 and 17 at middle and high school because there's a lot that you have to do. I think that the more more and more kids are being referred, more and more kids are being are receiving services and are being identified. They're making the numbers go up and people are spreading themselves so thin that if you could actually give the service that the child needs, it would help. And then we wouldn't have possibly so many kids going out of district. Um, yeah, I would imagine that at 28 or whatever, you know, th those people are going to have a hard time with the expectation of communication that with the paperwork load with uh, you know making sure every kid is observed enough uh, you know that they're able to uh, follow up with teachers and, and and you know make sure the IPs are being followed correctly uh, and that meetings must be brutal in, in trying to fit into school days so you know in good conscience how can we give them 28 what can we do uh, to hire the people we need, how, how many people would we need to do a job that would be respectful uh, to the families and students who need the help? You would probably need another 10 to 15 special educators. Okay. I just want to make sure that's understood. Mm -hmm. you know, what we're up against is significant. Right. And, and you're talking about increasing percentages of kids uh, over time that need supports. Uh, beyond uh, you know regular uh, classroom experience and typical communication with the teacher, special ed has grown, you know, doubled uh, since you know say the 90s. Right. In terms of, of the number of things that are offered, the number of things we know, and therefore the number of kids who fall under that umbrella. But it's, you know, it, it's it's a gargantuan you know task to meet their needs, and I don't want people to assume that of course we're doing great things that we're where we want to be it's taxing right you know it's taxing to be able to do everything they're assessing kids writing ieps providing specially designed instruction supervising paraprofessionals talking to parents it's daunting um it's overwhelming and, and daunting and and you can't get ahead of it and well-intentioned people are working really really hard to be able to help the kid but if you don't if you you have to balance what am i going to do do my paperwork or see the the child you know you have to see it and then you have to flip on the other side then that means I'm after school weekends nights Jack you said something interesting earlier because of COVID we're seeing an increase in, in the need so do you see this lasting this increase for the next 11 years because if you know you go back one year you had kids in the first grade affected by COVID so would that have to flush itself out because now we're not dealing with that anymore. So in other words, we have a whole generate 
a 1 through 12 that's been affected by this? And do you see that dissipating after that 11th year, things that are directly affected by what went on the last couple of years? It's going to take a while because it's not going to be just that group. You have, you're going to have lasting impacts and effects of COVID financially or, or whatever it is. It's going to, so it may be your kids right now, but you still have families that are going to have children that are financially impacted, that they're going to struggle. You know, people who couldn't have services are maybe now having services, uh, families, uh, adults. So it's going to be a while before it gets before it gets turned around. The flip side of it is is that special ed when you ask about special ed, it's not just special ed that needs the help. We would cut down on our special ed numbers if we had some more supports for our kids, our regular ed kids through intervention or coaches or whatever. We we need help. I was going to ask that question. <laughs> Thank you for um, answering that. Did you, um, thank you for the information. Did you want to speak any real quickly to the out of district cost? It was just a bullet on here. Our out of district costs are, are going, growing exponentially. And why is that? When we're not meeting the needs of our students right no. now. Why? Okay. We're not, we're not meeting them. And it's not because we don't have hard work, working people. It's not because we don't have some resources that we're trying to put in place. It's um, late or too late for some kids. We're having a lot of kids move in too, but we're too late. People have tried really, really, really hard with what they've had available, but it's not enough. That's the, the bluntness of it. Okay. So, and, and Don, you had asked it much more eloquently than I did a week or two ago um, about the staffing. And particularly if we're establishing, you talked about the establishment of an autism program, which I would imagine uh, thins the staff a bit if, if those if a lot of those children need more one-on-one -on -one or, or small group um, what would do you have ideas on on the hiring process I mean how do we get more people we, I asked this two weeks ago and it's just, <coughs> and it's just, I'm not putting you on the spot oh, no, I, I can, I can just, I'm yeah not you can say anything because <laughs> um, to me we talk about that and I think the we know what the budget line was for uh, private tuition, which may encompass other things, but there's, yeah, there's a lot of, that that price tag's not going down. Uh, we got all these vacancies, and I think we just, if we look at the uh, report from this week, we have another vacancy, right? Um, so this is a problem, and I hear all the things about, there's a known thing in the state, and this is a known, it, okay, good, but what's the solution? Um, I'm not saying you have the solution, but do you have any ideas, like, like, what's the talk of the town? Until you pay more we're not going to have people. My department is going to get decimated this year. Fair enough. They're, they're, they're leaving and you can see on the contracted service provider, if you looked at any of the numbers, if I have to fill the probably 12, 15 professional staff, I don't, I don't know where I would even get those people. I did 43 interviews for contracted people for paras and um, a special educator came up with nine people. Mm. It's an awful lot of time to put in to only get nine. Mm -hmm. So if, if we don't start paying people more, they're going to do what they're doing right now. They're going to neighboring districts that are paying more. And by paying more, I'm not talking a million dollars here. Some of them are, are, are minimal amounts that they're going up. But in special ed right now, we can really name our place where we want to go that's that we're at that point now we're in doing interviews and people are saying mm, I, I'll think about it but I could go here and here and here and here we have so many openings we just can't get ahead of it and people are leaving education thank you for that okay, thank you so much for the information and good work do you want the contracted or do you just want to look no, at that? No, go ahead. I mean, if oh. you want to speak to it really quickly. Yeah, and, yeah sorry. <laughs> I just know it's a big price tag, but go ahead. <laughs> it is a big price tag. Yeah, I just, so to answer your question, if you just read that, you can see that we need to do something about how we're attracting people. Our contracted service people are paid a lot more money through their companies. And um, we have some really good people in your community that probably would come to work for us. 
if you paid. So, if we could attract more people, would we have as much out of district placement? Or we, would we be able to keep a lot of these or some of these students in district because that cost is going up? So, I'm just, is, is there a Right. So is there a balance there that if we can attract other people and keep that we'd be able to keep some of these students here and lessen our costs on the out of district placements? It's um, if you could lower the caseloads, mm -hmm. give more specially designed instruction, then um, and intervene with some of those uh, other resources or services. I think you could, but what's happened is it, it's. You wait and wait and wait and hope. And then you get too far behind, like you said, and then you don't have the choice. Right. So if you could lower caseloads and um, do professional development for everyone and put some interventions in, you probably could get ahead of it. So where I came from, we had 24%. We went down 7% by putting in intervention, professional development, and making it so more especially designed instruction. To, I, to tackle the disability. So can we look at some sort of projections and plans to do something like that and see what the cost would be to really get to where we need to be versus our savings of not having the, the out-of-district placement? I mean, I think those are numbers I'd like to see that if, if it makes sense to bring people in and we're going to save more on the out-of-district placement and we can help our students in our schools, I think ultimately that's the better thing to do. But, I mean, if we run those numbers and we say, no, it's not going to make, you know, based on projections, it's not going to make much of a difference, then you're we also have to figure have, out where we go from there. Yeah, you're also going to have some students that are going to be out of district, but really if we had... Oh, well, I mean, clearly, but absolutely. I'm just, like, those borderlines that we're, mm -hmm. we're having to place because we don't have what we need in here, what is that costing us versus staff? And having them here and, and being able to to help our students in our own buildings. And you know, our, your average <coughs> cost for out of district is probably a hundred thousand to three hundred. <coughs> well, that's my point. So if yeah. we have, so yeah. Well, and, so, and contract and services would go down too. Mm -hmm. I mean, if but that's why if, if we can have just some sort of a <coughs> an understanding of how many students we're talking about, I think. Yeah, if you can save money and keep them in house and and help our services in, in here, that's what we want to do. Yeah. So let's start looking at those numbers again. And I've looked at a lot, not as much as Mark would look at it, but um, with data, maybe I could, <laughs> I could grab him one day. I was gonna say Mark will help you. <laughs> they probably could. could. He'll give yeah. us charts. <laughs> He's just so but certainly um, <laughs> have looked at kids in placement and um, how they ended up. I figured that. Yeah. Um, in those placements, like what didn't we have? What oh. could we have? And within that too, because I love these, I love the programs that you're looking at, um, starting and getting some support for. But obviously, to get those programs started, you're going to need staff. So, some of those numbers, could we have some reflection in that? Of if we're going to start this program here at this school, what would those numbers look like too? Because I do think, like Kristen said, it, in like yeah. the cost analysis of. It might be a little bit more at the beginning to get the program up and running, but it might be. And it, and it will be. It, you know, we know that, right? It will be really, really expensive, and then it will pay for itself in the end. Um, well, free. we're doing it with lights, so I think we need to do it with yeah. students. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I mean, you know, I mean, I think oh, that's yeah. true. You know, let's, yeah. let's put the money where it belongs. Yeah. Pretty good. So. Just clarification real quick a hundred to three hundred per student or total per student, oh, per student yeah. just clarifying yeah <laughs> and then also can we get on that cost analysis um, what the other districts around us are paying and what that change would look like paying for for the um, special education people that we are leaving oh or, uh, so yes. not what we currently would pay for them but what that cost would be if we became competitive what Justin had said the other day when it, you know, it can be two hundred fifty thousand dollars with transportation and tuition and mm -hmm. legal and all that stuff. It's, a, it's expensive. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have fun, Mark. <laughs> Sorry. I think Mark's already got a, a data table for you. Also, probably does. <laughs> <laughs> 
Alright, next thing on the list is policies first read action item. So this is for a first read for policy BEA, school board meetings, JFAB, which is admission and tuition and non-resident students, JFAC, which is tuition for preschool, pre-K, and kindergarten, and policy KDCA, which is display and distribution of informational materials and announcements. Did anybody from policy want to talk about these? Yes, ma'am, baby. No, but I, I'll talk about it. I'm not. I'm, oh, go ahead. No, no, I, I have a question. Um, JFAC, mm -hmm. which is a tuition for a preschool, pre-K, and kindergarten. So I'm just going to follow this up with the red charting that we just talked about. Should there be language in here in this policy specific to red charting that states that, that students that do red chart are required to pay and would be responsible for their own transportation and clarify that? We can certainly bring that back. I, I mean, I'm just I'm looking at that, and I think that needs to be in there. Um, it is real declarative in the letter and the tuition agreement that that family signed as well. But it would also be great to codify it in policy. So, because I'm looking at delinquent accounts mm -hmm. specifically, and it talks about your child will be will be removed. Um, do we actually have to remove children? Or hopefully, I'm <coughs> hoping. We have not forcibly removed anybody this year. We do have families that we're engaging with that have um, a debt to the school district based on the tuition agreement that they sign that we continue to talk with and troubleshoot with. Okay. Um, there comes to be a challenge, particularly for students who have redshirted that are not paying that tuition, is that they also legally need to be enrolled in a full program of studies. Uh, so if we did remove those children, um, and again, this would be not at the parents' discretion, but the school's discretion, we'd be moving them from kindergarten to first grade, wow. which causes a whole other series, we think, of challenges for, for the students uh, themselves. Yes. So there is complicated layers to, to how that type of things unfold. So that's why I guess I'd like to see the, something in our policy. I know it doesn't, but then that raises the question for me, is do we run into a situation where Red shirting can cause us problems with accounts and whatnot in the situation that we shouldn't be allowing it. So, so perhaps something to think about more and talk about more when Lucy comes back in two weeks with more updated numbers, <laughs> and we'll we'll decide or have some more discussion on that because, I mean, as you said, the challenge becomes if you have a Somebody who's red shirting and then the parents decide we're not gonna pay. Now we run into a situation where you can't remove them because by state law we have to have them in school and we have to provide education to them full time. Correct. But now the parents if we allow a waiver from our perspective to allow these children to red shirt and then the parents choose not to pay, it puts us in a situation now where it creates hardship on on our end and we've potentially taken other children that might move into the district and said, well, there's not a spot for you there now anymore, or I don't want to say overcrowded a classroom, mm -hmm. or, or we have the policy to have an additional person in the classroom to accommodate them. Yes. So then that raises the question of whether or not we should even allow red shirting under those circumstances. Pre-pay. Pre-pay. <laughs> We are uh, That's altering not a bad the, idea. We're altering the payment structure yeah. now to, to try to have some more front-loaded yeah, things and to be able to get more commitment to get more fine numbers. Um, I'd also say that like unlike the last conversation where there was a lot of hypotheticals, we were talking about a lot of what ifs. Um, the situation that Kristen that you just described is the current reality that we're we're in now in terms of families redshirting, being in programs that are tuition-based programs, having their child be six years old uh, but not making those tuition payments. <clears throat> I like the prepay idea. Yeah. If you choose to redshirt, it's, it's your option. You have because of because you you understand that this is the amount and it has to be what? prepaid. Jack. Yep. So, we're probably going to come upon some hard times here with the recession and inflation and all of that. But we probably will be. So many. That's what the whatever. So now I know everyone says politically. So, <laughs> so my thing is I don't want to penalize the students. 
with some undue burden on the parents because for me it always comes back to what's in the best interest of the student and all the adults will assume their responsibilities but if you make them up front and load it maybe some parents and families don't have the ability to do that and the cost would come the person who really pay the real price would be the student who probably has an issue because they're desiring to be redshirted in the first place and and you know if you make an agreement you should stick by it um, but again my concern is always for the kid period so I mm -hmm. I don't know if I you know if you can strike payments out or work out a situation where someone's struggling I always think that's a, a better path traveled um, but, and, and I think but everyone's on that same page that. and the policy language I think spells that out in the blank with payments yeah, it, it does, yeah. encourages right. a relationship a conversation discussed your financial circumstances have not been discussed with the superintendent's office so if they come forward to you and disclose and you enter into some type of I, I think agreement somebody who says I, I can't pay and can you work out a payment plan is different from somebody so, saying I'm gonna stop paying now because my child is now of age and you owe Yep. You right. owe my child uh, in education yeah. after we've yeah. given them a waiver to right. allow that right. yeah. to happen. Yeah. So that's, right. I mean, I, I, I completely get where you're coming from in that circumstance, but but I don't want to get into a, a circumstance now where, you know, where it, it becomes a trend to say my child's now six, you owe me an education, so I'm not going to pay anymore mm -hmm. yeah, under no. these circumstances where we've arranged things on our end to allow it to happen by being generous we get ourselves sometimes into a yeah. yes. yes yeah and that's uh, that's what I'm just saying I think we need to try to figure out how to incorporate and include in the policy to make sure that that does not continue to happen so we'll bring those two <laughs> suggested policy language pieces yes. back mm -hmm. yeah. yes yeah free I would just be hesitant on the <coughs> prepay front loading end because like we said we could have in district um, non redshirted students five of them apply and now that space is unavailable to that student and we said it would be on a as available basis and now we've collected this money so we've gone into but you could do it as of like it has to be prepaid as of you know the, the child turning six <clears throat> or you could have it prepaid by October 1st or balance in full by it doesn't have to be so you would allow that register you could allow the start of it and then make that payment due by a certain date but why not or all, all payments need to be done before prior to the child turning six and it'll be prorated out so if your child turns six in May you'll have nine months if your child turns six in December you got three and then we can't then it doesn't run into a situation so where I, I think what she was saying is what happens if you have someone you know pay up front and then all of a sudden you have three new students come in from well, in once but once this first day of school starts they're in that class we can't right. then say oh okay. we have three students from yeah, Atkinson right. now you got to well, move then yeah. we have to do something because we've made that commitment right okay you wouldn't move them out from yeah. but that's what I'm saying those those red shirts aren't really going to be committed until almost closer to the school year because we can't do that we need to know what our numbers are so they can get a tentative so approval they, prepay. they could prepay <laughs> they could put a deposit in but then they could prepay once school starts like you could then say we're gonna you can put your deposit in to hold your spot your spot is tentative based on whoever might come in up until whatever two days before school whatever you know we and if your spot here doesn't work you have a choice to either come to first grade or to go to another school, school in the district but you have to make that choice and if you then choose then you have say 30 days to pay the balance or whatever policy wants to I mean I'm just throwing out ideas but once that child once school starts and that child's in a class they're not that's then we've committed to that so so it's not going to be like, oh, we got your money. Oh no, now you don't, you can't do this. So, sure. <laughs> so. Sorry. I want to make a motion that we we accept these for first read. Yeah. Motion by Kristen. Second. Second by Mark. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? And abstained. Nine zero zero. All right. Uh, vacancy reports. So Fran isn't with us this morning, but you do have the vacancy report. It's night. You mean <laughs> <to say> night. <laughs> Did I say no, it's this, this morning? morning. Yeah. Sorry, I had 
It's been a long day, Justin. <laughs> 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 Brian's not here. We're provided for you. Uh, we're just, you know, we're still looking at 23 positions. As Kelly highlighted, a large majority of those are within the arena of special education. All right. Does anybody have any questions about the job vacancies? All right. Thank you for that. Moving on to discipline data. So this is a continuation of uh, things that we've done with the board uh, already this year on two occasions. This will be the third kind of data collection. Uh, it's specific again to the middle school and the high school. Um, this is information at the bottom table from February 17th to the present. Um, and we have included the previous two tables from the previous two board meetings just to so have some comparisons in terms of over time. Um, and we did add uh, three additional categories here just to reflect um, you know, some of the new, newer things that have happened that we want to make sure that we're reflecting uh, in these data reports to you. Thank you for the information. Does anybody have any questions about the discipline data that has been presented? Go ahead, Shana. What are we going to do about this? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I don't know. My understanding was that this discipline data has been coming to the board in reflection of a request from our administration at the middle school and the high school for um, lack of a better terminology, an in-school suspension support. Position, system, um, I clearly think by the data that we've been seeing that it's needed. I don't know what anyone else thinks. I'm wondering how we go about that or, I mean, it seems as though, um, you know, our staff at the middle school and high school are working hard to keep students safe obviously and in the building as much as possible um based on these numbers in terms of um you know in school and out of school um, but the in school suspension numbers just keep increasing um and i yeah one of the things that's kind of neat about this is that you can see at the middle school level they are attempting to keep about 50 percent of their suspensions in school and they're doing it without the support or necessarily appropriate resource. So I'm talking about personnel. Um, so really, I, I would describe it as we're, we, we, these previous conversations were about hiring staff uh, that would support students staying in school for longer durations of time, also connecting the services uh, that they're either do or would benefit from, and having more face time with the adults that are the main drivers of, of their achievement. Um, uh, I can also share that at the leadership team, uh, we are certainly looking at open and vacant positions uh, and considering the, you know, where are the needs that we would like to maybe come back here and have conversations about staffing areas of the district that either haven't been staffed before or haven't been staffed ever. Um, and maybe advocating for some of those down the road as well. Uh, but clearly, yes, there is a need to connect more students uh, to the services and the personnel that deliver those services inside of the schools. Uh, versus having the only option is not having them with us. Um, and the research is abundantly clear uh, on that and, and, and all the ramifications that come with it. Okay. So could you, go ahead. So when you first came to the board um, about this, you were talking about repurposing positions for the in-school suspension um, support. And I fully think that something has to be done. Uh, clearly looking at those numbers. But I, I stop short of repurposing positions. Um, is there a way to look at it, um, I, I guess, differently now? Um, what the position, do we know the, what the positions were, or are they still the same ones that you were thinking of before if we were to implement something like this? Yeah, so I, more broadly, I mean, we looked at the number of positions that are open and vacant in our, in our district. We have a dollar figure that's associated with that. We're now we've really engaged in that conversation about naming the actual positions that we would like to bring in. Um, it's just a matter of, of making that decision, and you've got a set of priorities, and you've got a set of needs, and you need to kind of mesh those two things together, and we're at the late stages of doing that. Mm -hmm. So is that something that you would bring to the board um, soon? That's my understanding. That's been the process here, that anything that is repurposed comes here, uh, and it comes here for discussion. We did have a meeting where two specific positions, I believe, were suggested or tossed up. Yes. That's, That's yeah, what you're referring yeah. To. right at the um, meeting when we were at the PAC. I only remember the physics. I remember the second. 
Right. Yeah. They were both steam. Both mm -hmm. okay. And I'd offer that that conversation has even gotten more generalized about not necessarily targeting specific positions, but looking more district wide mm -hmm. than only within the building confines of what staff have been allocated there in the past. Okay. So Oops. casting a little bit of a wider perspective in that. One more question. I'm sorry, Jack. Would you be looking at not just the high school and middle school, but the elementary schools as well for something like this? Or perhaps something at one of the elementary schools for all the other elementary school kids that could serve would be better served being in house yeah and i think that's the, to that latter point of looking at it as a district need um and allocating those things that we're going to see are going to be best meeting the needs of the kids that are in front of us right now right so i apologize but in school suspension in school support in school okay like i labeled it that i'm sorry <laughs> So explain to me, if you would, how this works. And when we talk about additional resources to support that, yeah. is that a teacher for two or three students for the day? I, I need to have get my arms around this because I know nothing about sure. it. Sure. So there's lots of you different. You won't hear me say that too often. Either. <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of different models out there. Um, but it, it, the, mo the one that I'm most familiar with is that it would be a staff member that would be in the TTA. Um, so it's a professional teacher that is certified and licensed. We'd be ideally looking for somebody that not only has a teaching background, but that has a either a mental health or counseling or social work background. Um, but that person almost serves like a pivot point for that child. So as opposed to an administrator having oh, the only option, and specifically this is what they have at the high school now, is like when the behavior rises to a point where the child needs to be separated from the community, the one option now is that they are out of school suspended, meaning they don't have access to anything that's in the school, they can't come on campus, they can't access other services. This position allows those students that don't pose safety threats to staff or students to remain in school. Uh, and that person coordinates time with their teachers, with their counselor, with their service providers, works with them one-on-one, -on -one, does some decision-making processing around how you got here, um, talks about solutions and orients more future planning and goal setting about how not to get back here. But it serves as a conduit to stay connected versus what a, what a suspension is, is essentially a complete and total disconnection. Okay, and would that teacher manage X amount of kids? How does, how does that, during the, during the school day, or what, yeah. what would that dedicate? Yeah, they, they, would, they would be responsible for those students that are assigned to them on those no. days. Um, but Jack, there would also be some other auxiliary things that that person would do that if no one is with them that day, if no one is assigned to them that day, there are kind of two or three other layers that they could do to go and check and connect with kids throughout the day um, that would be identified by administration would that would be talking through some of their support and targeted group meetings so they do provide a level of intervention that would be beyond what we would provide for all kids mm -hmm. sometimes support. it's just a fist bump in the hallway yeah some some right. support for at risk before they get to the point of infraction uh, you know. ideally I spent almost a year in the school, and I'll tell you, I, I, it was interesting in the high school that I was endeared to those kids that just needed, you know, the fist pump or the, they just needed a little bit of attention, a little bit of esteem because they were starving for, for a little bit of reassurance. So I, I understand that aspect of it, uh, if you will. Um, but what I, on the flip side, I mean, I saw the numbers, I just wasn't sure if we were dedicating resources for one or two students mm -hmm. because of a misbehavior. I'm trying to wrap my arms around that. Yeah. And we have a whole bunch of challenges uh, within the district, so. And I'm gonna call on my inner Sheila to come out for a minute here. So. <laughs> um, oh, <man>. Because <laughs> going with what Jack's saying, I'm not, I mean, I'm not opposed to the idea of having somebody for the reasons that you're saying. My concerns come with if you only have one student that's in, this person's getting one-on-one -on -one attention, mm -hmm. you know, if they're a discipline problem and then, which they might need that and I get that, but we have so many other facets and as Sheila sat here and pointed out, rightfully so, we have so many students like that are just borderline that might just need that, that they're the good kids, they're the ones that are working hard, they're putting in the effort and they're doing everything and we don't have that resource for them. So it's kind of like that, that tough battle that yeah. You know, you have the kid that's doing everything right and needs the help, but we can't help that kid. But then we have another kid that might just be disruptive in class all the time, and maybe they do just need that one-on-one -on -one time to, to get through that and get over that hump so that they're not disruptive, but how do we balance that? 
Like that's a struggle. So mm -hmm. it's just something that when you do come back, those are questions that I'm I'm gonna want to see. Like how are we doing this? How are we how are we balancing this? I mean, I'm sure if there there's no students assigned that day, which is a great thing if that's the case, mm -hmm. that this person will be out there and doing stuff. But I don't want those kids that are <clears throat> that are and I'm not trying to say our good kids, bad kids, but the, okay. you know, that, yeah. that group of kids that really just come to school every day, they try to be good, they try to do good, and they might need that fist bump a little bit more too, and yeah. they don't get it. So how do we balance that? The challenge that I saw really was the teachers trying to teach the class and can't give that individualized attention that maybe that disruptive kid in the class is yearning for, right? Because right. she's got, or he's got a caseload and they got to get their work done. Um, it was an interesting, it was an educational experience for me. And, uh, I have yeah. a, a, a kind of related question, but yeah. I don't know if I'm not seeing it, if it's uh, something that you could provide. How many actual students are we talking about rather than just how many um, hours or how many days of suspension are? Uh, so e yeah. Each incident mm -hmm. in the little categories there is tied to a single student. So when you see assault, that's three. You know, there was an infraction from, from three different individuals over that time period. And I'm making that number up in, in the next So category. it wasn't just three assaults by the same person. Correct. Like it wouldn't, it clearly is three it's different people. Three distinct incidents that's tagged okay. to three distinct uh, individual students. Three. So do, what about if an incident had, let's say, a vape issue and a physical assault? We would always categorize it in the one that's just most significant or more severe. Okay. So, it, so it's not getting so again, it's okay. Mm -hmm. So it's so okay. for clarification for the month of January, uh, and again, this is the art, it, this is uh, one of the lowest months here. We'll look at that. There are eight <laughs> individual uh, incidences or students for a total of 24 days. So in theory, each one received a three-day out of school for that month. Correct. Just to make certain I'm reading. At the high school level. Uh, yeah. Okay. Six. Yeah, they could have been any range of days because there's usually a range of potential days as a consequence depending on the kids. Yeah. No. I'm just. I'm. I'm. There are eight individual uh, infractions there. Right. Okay. So yes, the math would work that way. But yep. to Don's point, that's typically not how things are would be assigned. Oh, okay. Yep. Bree, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to comment that it looks like. There is well over a school year amount of days that we are tallying here, and it could easily fill someone's position to carry out that role. Um, and maybe perhaps we look at instead of, because honestly, it looks like a two person job <laughs> looking at all these numbers here, um, well over 400 ish, adding them all up over the school year between the high school and middle school that maybe it would look more like a two-person, one as an educator in there helping with the education piece and one as a social work psychologist type of in both schools? health worker that they fluctuate or that they come to the same room, whatever kind of is needed so that those students not only get that education piece of it, but they get that coping mechanism, that support service, that to hopefully see that lessening of acting out or um, giving coping positive coping strategies that's necessary for these students maybe creating a better therapeutic plan for their education and it would um, maybe open up more candidates versus trying to find that unicorn both dual good work you 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 almost seem to from what I'm hearing, uh, maybe a guidance counselor type person. Mm -hmm. But it used to be. <laughs> in there so that they could provide that guidance, this, this social framework, but also you know, allow the student, instead of when they're suspended, going home and playing Xbox and falling further behind, and potentially becoming more disruptive because they're further behind. Mm -hmm. Now there's, now they have somebody there accountable. who cares for them and they're accountable. This is your homework for the following classes. I've spoken with your teachers so that there's not the distance or the incentive to be you know more disruptive when they come back. It almost sounds like a hybrid guidance counselor type thing. I mean, you're describing the ideal model is that there is two types of learning that's going on there um, and some of it's preventative uh, and some of it is about keeping pace and so that we doesn't get old. We, we once had that here mm -hmm. you know and, and we had it for, for several years but it was expensive to hire 
somebody that qualified. Um, and, and, and there's a burnout position in a way, too. We, we, we went through uh, people, but then we lost the will to pay for that as a district, too, and we, we, we aren't doing that anymore. So, you know, I think you have to, we're paying the, a bit of the, the price over time for not having it, you know, as opposed to paying for it and Jonah, so let, thinking that's Jonah. a problem. Yes, yes, yes. And, and also, I look at this as the counter argument of having somebody be there and those kiddos that need a little extra that are following the rules and just sort of, you know, doing the balancing act but could need a little bit more. Our classroom teachers may just have more time to do that if they're not being disrupted as much as they are. Mark, then Jack. With your, I'll put you on the spot here, having seen that play out and seen the pros and cons which you're touched on, What's your impression as to how that how that worked? I mean, so there's a burnout position. It's so hard it to find somebody who's really good with that population, who um, you know isn't going to also aspire to some something right. that's going to be a oh perhaps an administrative job as an assistant principal or something like that. Uh, so generally, they they are uh, they're people who have. Uh, some experience over time. So you're not going to hire a rookie. When we hired young, we paid the price for that. You know, so you, you need people with some background. That you, were, you were alluding to that, somebody counselor type, somebody, somebody who has, you know, uh, developed uh, the ability to work with uh, at-risk students, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then to be there every day with, with kids, uh, with the, you know, in and out process and try to have programs to help work with them. You need a very skilled person. So, you know, but it, it, they're out there. You know, you just have have to, you know, try to uh, sustain them, maintain them. Uh, Three year contracts. There we go. Mm -hmm. So let me follow my sword as being the old school guy who had a right. I will not talk in class a hundred times on the chalkboard only before I could go out to recess. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't stick. What was that? I said only a hundred. <laughs> well, it, it grew exponentially over time. Um, <laughs> Where's the consequence in all of this? I mean, I understand the reaching out, helping, giving the extra assistance, but it almost seems like there's never a consequence. And, and, and I don't, you know, publicly I can't articulate that, but I just feel as though there's got to be some, geez, I don't want to do this again. Yeah, I think there's a, I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen there. It can get paired with an out-of-school suspension. That can happen. I think the consequence... But then we go back to the double negative, right? Sure. Yeah. At the consequence really is separation from your community. And this is a way to do it by keeping kids in school. Great. Last comment on this so we can move on to the next. Um, well, I would just to kind of answer Jeff also is maybe again being removed from your peers and your social network is consequence enough if you're being isolated I'm not saying isolated but if you're being placed in a room Real to time. better give you support that you need and give you those coping strategies to hopefully change your behavior in the future um, and then I lost it okay did you lose it I did <laughs> <laughs> all right oh can we use any of the funds of the open position special education for said role special education yeah, special yeah. Special yeah. Special Kelly wants more yeah Kelly wants more I hope we want to take this would be a service provider I'm trying to help you we have we have budgeted positions in our field but we don't have the money to pay right yeah okay or outsource that like we didn't say it again all right. Next you're, thing. You're going to create like bullet points from tonight, right? Say yeah, it again. No <laughs> Next thing on the list is the NESDAQ reports. Did I say that right? Here it comes. Got it, man. Oh, <laughs> and look oh, at the chart. Oh, my. Look at these charts. Look I'm going to go line by line on that you're, chart that no, I. No, you're don't. not. Not every line, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, go um, ahead. Boy, this is strange seeing you there and her there. It's just. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, I was asked to, to briefly talk about that those NESDAQ reports. Um, really what it boils down to is just projections. Um, we use uh, different ways to sort of project what do we need to do, uh, where are we going with numbers. Um, you know, Lucy speaks uh, often about looking at those numbers 
uh, quite detailed uh, to make decisions uh, at the secondary level. We look at it a little bit more broadly. We have a little bit more buffer um, in our ability to absorb, if you will, kids coming in. Um, and so, you know, what what you have is looking at, you know, the way we project out our numbers uh, and the way that NESDEC, uh, which is, I believe it stands for New England School Development Council, provides us numbers on an annual or I think even biannual basis. Um, to just look at projection numbers, we use those numbers to then help just make decisions. Um, they're usually pretty in line. Um, you know, some years and they're a little bit above us, some years they're a little bit below us. Um, but like I said, we just use uh, these numbers to, to make projections and then make decisions about what are we doing for our programs, what, how are we running classes, uh, designing classes, and then also uh, maybe some long-term uh, projections, because now it looks like uh, the district is, you know, but this latest projection from NESDEC, it looks like it, it is growing again. We were on decline for our numbers, um, but now it looks like it's on its, on its way back up. So, I say this uh, re relates that it, the, the, a lot of the problems we had, that we've been able to keep the buildings running well, it, it, we're, run, we're able to run them because our numbers are down. Mm -hmm. But when we had 1,500 plus students in the same building, or same buildings, you know, the middle school was, was over a thousand. We were at, at 15 plus, and it bears out in those numbers. We did not fit. You know, we we had tremendous space problems. We had traffic problems. We had more discipline problems. Yeah, you know, it, 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 so I think we need to pay attention. We have about 10 years that <laughs> until we get back to that position. Uh, you know, we, we tried one-way hallways because we had too many people. We couldn't get to class on time. Mm. You know, so you know, I, I we could get back to those days if we're not thinking about that now. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Does anybody else have any questions for, about these data reports or anything like that? Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, yep. All right. Last <laughs> thing is school board goals. You have them in your packet. We do not need to vote on these until is it June 30th? By June 30th, is that right? It, it, there's no set date, but I mean, it's just we we try to yeah, like we should have them. Yeah, I think yes. So the, no action is needed tonight on this, but what I do want you all to do is to please look at this over the next month, and by middle of May, um, email me anything that you think needs to be added. Um, if there's something that you think we've met, you need to take it off. If you want to add something, um, but let me know. Email me by the middle of May so that we can kind of get these together and then move forward, move forward with them. So this is really just on the agenda as a reminder because we, we talked about this the last meeting too. We did. Yep. So we're just reminding everyone, do you have more, please? <laughs> yes. Just <laughs> tisk. tisk. So, all right. Administrator's report. Uh, four things quickly tonight that Sandy and I wanted to share. Uh, the first is just another continued update on the administrative openings at Sandown North and also at uh, Sandown Central. Uh, we are still on pace for the goals there. Um, we should have someone uh, on board with us at Sandown North by the end of this week. Uh, and at Sandown Central, we'll be looking, uh, again, still early or mid-May. Uh, to be having a qualified person come on board with us there. So that's right. where we stand with those two pieces. Right. Um, I, I alluded to it earlier that we're having those open vacant conversations and talking about staffing and needs. Um, so that's going to be a continued conversation and leadership in the future and, and maybe uh, some upcoming and successive board meetings for us to bring some thoughts and ideas to you there. Um, you know, the other thing that Bill was here earlier tonight and one of the, his most, uh, the lines that I enjoy from him the most, he didn't get to say tonight, uh, but I'm really excited about this work because every student is an expert in their experience and for us to be able to listen to that and then learn from it and make changes in the schools based on what we hear uh, and see from kids is a really, really powerful thing. So I'm, I'm excited about his work that will start with us. Uh, and lastly, when we come back and we convene, it will be May. Um, so just in terms of students and families and staff, we're really looking to push hard through that month and into June uh, and really end on a great note. Uh, for kids and families. So uh, lots of great things happening in the schools around this time of year, uh, but also some really kind of stringent academic things happening in classrooms as well. So we want to be sure that we pay attention to both. Thank you. Sandy, did you have anything to add? Not tonight, no. Not tonight? No. All right. <laughs> All right, personnel report. We have one professional nomination, and then we also have one professional resignation. 
The nomination is for Eric Swanson, a fifth grade teacher for Atkinson Academy. I'd like a nomination to um, accept. No, I'm saying it backwards. A motion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> it's very, very lucky. I'll make a motion to accept the uh, professional nomination for Eric Swanson, fifth grade teacher at Atkinson Academy. I'll second that. Motion by Shauna, second by Jack. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? And abstain. Okay. And the professional resignation. I'm not even going to try to say that last name. I'll make a motion to accept the professional resignation of Joyce Sagbini, Special Education Case Manager at Pollard Elementary School. And I'll second that. And thank her for her dedication and service yes. to the students at Pollard School. Yes, thank you. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? And abstain. Committee reports. I was just going to say, gonna I, was say like, I was like, what's this blue tab for? <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the save. <laughs> All right. I make a motion to accept the renominations as listed on this form. We don't have to do them individually, do we? We didn't last time. No. Second that. that yeah, that works. Okay. Second by Mark. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? And abstain. One abstention. All right. Committee reports. I'm going to start on that side. Don, do you have anything? Uh, not from the committee, no. <laughs> <laughs> Curriculum assessment. We did a first read um, of the revisions for portfolio and writing elective. Um, talked about the professional development day, which um, um, sounded like it was a really um, uplifting event and it was um, had a lot to do with mental health and um, the keynote speaker um, went um, he talked about being positive with discipline and um, so it sounded like that was a great um, that was great and then there were two sessions and the teachers could choose from a variety of different um, classes in each session um, and that was curriculum assessment, and I'll give Sean a wellness, <laughs> and that's it for me. Thank you. you can pull up your list. <laughs> anything? I can do wellness if you want. Do you have anything? Okay. Good. Uh, yeah, I got a few things. Go for Sorry. it. Well, I skipped you last time. Yeah, you did, didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? So, um, first of all, I guess what I just want to say is we sent out a letter. This board sent out a letter. Um, Last week, Friday, I think, right? Yes. And in that letter, we had appointed um, Justin as the interim superintendent and Sandy as the assistant. Um, so just some context to that, because uh, Mr. Kellen had reached out and asked that we share some information on him, which I would like to do tonight. Um, and just an explanation, because he would like everyone to know that on March 24th, he had emergency neurosurgery to evacuate a subdural hematoma, which was the result of a concussion. So in short, he had brain surgery to remove a brain bleed. Um, Chris is home recovering. Uh, he and his family are very grateful for all the love, care, support um, that he's received from everyone, from his colleagues, from this board, from the entire Timberland Regional Community School District. Um, He's looking forward to a full recovery and a full return to work. He's hoping sometime in May. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, it's you know he's got a he's got a road ahead of him, but we're all here to support him. Um, we're all wishing him the best. Um, he's probably watching, though he probably shouldn't be. <laughs> so I mean, it's like you know the, when you want to yell at your child on TV and say, "Go to bed, Chris." Um, so <laughs> go to bed, Chris. Get your rest. Please continue to take care of yourself. Again, you have all of our support. And we're all looking forward to your return when you are fully able and ready to do so. Um, but he did want me to share that. So just an explanation to the situation as to, to why we've made the decisions that we've had. And I want to thank Justin and Sandy for um, being so cooperative and helpful and willing to step in and do what they're doing. And we appreciate that. So thank you to both of you. Um, 
safety we had a meeting since our last meeting we did we did yeah <laughs> so <laughs> i'm just trying to my dates it's late um we met we're, we're continuing to move forward um we had a good full meeting there um lots of things to work on clearly things i'm not going to talk about here mm -hmm. but um lots of positive things for the district moving forward um, and going in that direction um following that uh, we had a facilities meeting that katie stood in for jack because unfortunately I forgot to tell Jack that we do it right after our safety committee meetings and he was out of town. So Jack will be at the next one. But that being said, um, we had a, a long discussion about, about different things. Um, lots of things with Carl moving forward. Again, um, we have the lease project that's going to move forward, but that's not really what we talk about in facilities. It's more of the day-to-day -day things and what's happening, um, things of that nature. Um, it was a little disappointing to hear from thing, some things from Carl about some destruction that's happening on the property again um, we had the same issues prior but that was more TikTok challenge related and other stuff and it seems that now it's just happening to happen just to happen um, so um, from our facilities director and whatnot and from all of us I mean for any parents that are hearing this again you know we have a lot of good kids but then we have kids that do silly things here and there um, putting things in toilets burritos and clocking up toilets then causes problems, ripping off petitions that we just put on that cost us hundreds of dollars. So it's spring, spring fever's here, we get it, but you know, to the students, have some, have some pride in what you have, and to the parents, if you can just please talk to your children about not doing these things and having respect for our school. We don't need to be spending money on repairing things that we've already put the effort into making look good so um we have better things as i think everyone's heard tonight of where we can spend our money so sure. so let's focus on that so that's really all i have you covered all my stuff so well, you sure i did so uh, I can cip <laughs> met three items i'll let jack handle uh the very last one uh pretty long meeting it was very productive we decided to um, remove one of the lines which was I believe the second or third one that was uh, ever entered onto the CIP it keeps on getting bounced back uh, and bounced out it, and that was the connector between the pack the middle school and the high school there seemed to be very little appetite and the original cost estimate was on the order of 60 grand and now it would be multi-million up to the three million dollar mark and so the CIP decided that there were other things that those monies could go to that are that were much more important. Also, part of the CIP, in addition to having a member from each town, each of the four towns, uh, appointed generally by the selectmen, uh, it is part of the policy that was set up by the school board to have a school board rep on that CIP from each of the towns. So Jack and I are on that representing uh, Sandown. And what's that town you're from again, Jack? Uh, it's Atkinson. Atkinson. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so, in theory, we should have one from Danville and Plastow as well, according to how it's set up. So we can, you know, all chew on that a little bit. Do we have to? So that so it was designed by the school board to have that, and the rationale behind that is uh, the CIP obviously makes recommendations. Uh, with huge sums of money, and it would make sense to have two stakeholders from each town there representing their town, uh, and rep perhaps representing the interest in the town, uh, but also explaining to town's folks, not just having one person on there. But so, doesn't stuff from the CIP come before the board for final? For final, it does. For so final, it does, but for the nitty gritty. Uh, so I think that the concept there was you have what each town has the invite typically what i experienced was there was only be one or two board members available but there would always have to be at least a board member for us to have the meeting As but it would be just a, a matter of protocol to invite a member from each town so one town doesn't feel left out of the out of the circle it, and quite frankly we usually have one or two board members at each one of those meetings when was the last time that we would have did that right. that we would have had four board members I'd never just, it, they were always on the committee but necessarily didn't always attend because okay. it'd be like okay he's gonna be there 
so I don't have to go there because so you theory, always have someone want to point back. I nominate Katie. No. <laughs> no, I mean, I get the theory behind it, but if everything is going to be coming to the board for final discussion, I mean, it's like then you've got... You know what? The offer's out there. That's yeah, the no, and that's... Oh, yeah. So I, I just kind of feel like the two from... and I mean, as long as there's a member from the community from each town and then... And I keep an eye on there, it, there is. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> So in the like the next. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Brought okay. it forward. Go ahead. Oh, in thank the you. third, Jack. 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 Come on. Yeah. Uh, the, the third item that we were talking about, or you had suggested, was a holistic look at. Yeah. So we went from, from the prior middle school, um, principal had, had requested a, enhancement of the playground behind the middle school, and, and it was you know to the tune of what was it almost ninety. Yeah. Ninety thousand yeah. dollars. And I'm like, before we start moving forward with, you know, a patchwork quilt back there again, why, you know, because there's always a question as to what we have for assets in the district, and we talk in the strategic plan about reaching out to the communities. I said maybe it makes sense that we have someone from each town come in, tell us what they have for assets, see what we have for assets, and then after that uh, have the youth organizations come in and see what their needs are and kind of coordinate everything and then come up with a plan for for the grounds back there as opposed to you know ninety thousand dollars for behind the middle school is that going to be for the basketball court and something else and then you know five years from now we're going to change it because we we're working on a strategic plan and the fields are part of all of that so i, I just think having a coordinated effort maybe we need an extra field somewhere Maybe we don't, but you don't know that until you collect all the data. And once you have all the data points, then you know what your true needs are. And, you know, I just don't want to be making false steps or spending money unnecessarily. Um, and now you have all the stakeholders in the community, which we've always said we want, involved in the process. Um, that's just me. A more holistic approach to seeing what our needs are for the athletic fields across the community. It's not just the athletic fields. It's, it's because you do have... Uh, for instance, you have Atkinson Academy. Well, AYBS takes care of the, the ball fields back there, um, but then there's the playground that's kind of segued out. So it, it's good to know what's available within the district because I, I do look at us. I never look at it as, well, they're the kids from Danville. They can't go here. I look at it as we all have a symbiotic relationship with each other, and the better we can coordinate and communicate with each other throughout the district because there are some organizations – that will be back here with, with five or six groups and there were fields sitting empty somewhere else, you know, and, and having a five or six year old kid on one of these fields, guess what? They're a little pipsqueak, they, they don't destroy anything, but you have an 18 or a 16 U, U team out there on another type of sports field, now you're creating dangerous conditions because they create, you know, divots and ruts in, in their training and then another team comes on the next day and you may have, so I'm just saying, let's have a coordinated effort bring in the stakeholders, let's give it a shot. It was suggested that there are consultants to do that. Um, I, I just think we have so many volunteers and so many resources, and I, I'll only speak for Atkinson, but our, our recreation department is, is I mean, they're full-timers. They're second to none. Um, if you guys are interested in a good pickleball game, go up to Woodlock Park on a Sunday and <laughs> play some pickleball. But, uh, you know, I, I just think that's a – I think we need some coordination, and I don't want to go throwing good money and, you know, bad money into good and vice versa. That's what we're looking at. Yeah, that's what we're looking Thank you for shutting me up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that sounds good. But I'm getting wound up. Anything else? <laughs> no. Shauna. Um, wellness, wellness Committee, Matt. Um, and so what we were asked to do was to look at the current wellness policy and the um, proposed NHSBA policy and sort of merge them because they're not the same um, based on our current practices and some of the language that needs to be there. Um, really good discussion, so that's going to be coming to policy and since I double as the policy rep that I'll be able to explain um, some of the circumstances. Um, there's lots of different activities going on for wellness um, in all the individual buildings, both for students and for staff, which is really great to hear. I'm not going to get into the examples because it's getting kind of late, but keep it up. We appreciate all the efforts that you're doing for 
um, yourselves and for our um, students in the district. And then we got an update from the food services director, and this was a piece of information that I was not aware of, but I'm thrilled to share. So if it's not new news to you, then oh well, I'll just still be excited about it. But um, <laughs> she was sharing that some of the students have been growing vegetables and herbs um, in school gardens, and they are using them to provide um, school meals. And I think that is so awesome. Um, it's very cool, and the, the students get excited. Like, is this is this it's tomatoes that we grew? <laughs> yeah, and they get really excited and enthusiastic about it, and it just creates this really great conversation. But, anyways, long story short, we need to increase that across our schools. Mm -hmm. um, and and she is very interested in doing that and working with individual buildings to try and facilitate some um, community garden action. So, um, really great conversations, and then also um, a lot of talk about wellness in general, and obviously. Wellness is physical, and your brain is part of your body, so that mental health and mental wellness. And um, thrilled to hear that so May is Mental Health Awareness and Acceptance Month, and there's going to be lots of um, student and faculty engagement across the district um, with some different activities and presenters and things. So um, I just encourage everybody um, to chat with your kids and read what's coming home and engage in conversations with them about um, what they're hearing because it's it's all meant to be strengths-based approach to support them and knowing what to do and um, so really proud of the work that gets done here. We need a motion to remove that line from the that's what they told us at rewind <laughs> To remove the, thing remove for the, the line. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we make a great team, don't we? Um, All right, what motion do you need? A motion, motion. To, thank you. A motion to remove line number 78, which is the enclosed uh, off the CIP, which is the enclosure. <laughs> I just need a motion. I can read off. Thank you, Jack. A high school <laughs> pack, middle, middle school build building enclosure connector. Uh, I will make a motion to remove that from the CIP instead of bouncing forward uh, to infinity. Second. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. I mean, that was in there for a uh, safety reason. Uh, we, we have, we have a, an area that, you know, kids are throughout the day uh, leaving the building to get to another building. Uh, we, we thought that, you know, we, we would lose, you know, more kids uh, out to the back parking lots. You know, if we didn't do something that made that part of the high school building, you know, we, we have hundreds of kids going back and forth out there in all kinds of weather. We have slips, trips, falls. I'm sure you get that type of uh, information in the safety committee uh, over time. It's an area that's the, like the last to get get uh, you know swept up, and 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 it's it's a maintenance problem. Uh, you know. So we, we saw that, first of all, it was, it was, it was there so symbolically to make music not a separate thing mm -hmm. or the pack a separate place that only special kids get to go to. But there were two classrooms that were in the original plan also uh, that would have you know, done dance and other related things that would involve more kids and, and a safe passage to those places. So, you know, I'm against taking that off there because I saw the benefits, you know, from the you know management of a building when so you all we, did we, when you did you all redo a reevaluation so, other than just the fact that the price so, went up to fix it so actually we talked about that being the safety issue that was the reason why and then they explained to us that as the pack grew in cost things were taken out and that was one of the things that were taken off and what we said was instead of leaving these things on forever and just having this massive list that goes down the street you can always put it back on when we're better positioned financially to do it. It's just that there were so many priorities within the district, you know, for three million dollars, are we really going to create that pathway that the kids have been using for the last twenty years? How long has the pack been around? And and kind of, I mean, you could say the same thing well, about, the, nine, about the about the mods in the back. Then when you when you get yeah. to it, you know, what's that? Yeah. You know, so you keep pushing it down. It, it, everything increases. So, you know, I, I don't see that as patchwork. I, I, I see it falling through on a vision, you know, that got hijacked because of a financial situation that was out of our control with the escalating prices of, you know, getting the work done at, at the pack in the first place. Well, and I, following up, I mean, I, I agree with Don. On the, I mean, it's, it's a line in there, but I think the idea is to keep it 
on the forefront because you never know what could happen or what if all of a sudden there is money for something like that so there could be a safety grant that could come out to say you know schools that need certain things like this and, and to have this but if it's not in the CIP you're not going to qualify for that grant because it's not something we had in there as a vision to do so I think you should keep it in there for that purpose because I mean if you I hate to go down this road but I mean you talk about the school shootings and whatnot yeah, and that's yeah. a that's a perfect that's a perfect uh, you know scenario. Any, any any kid who goes to school there knows that 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 is going to be open between classes and people you know, are and going back and forth and go. But if if you can create that, so you could end up with a school safety grant that allows for things like that. So my that my, my question, that. just for my own edification, is if there's a, a safety if there's a type of grant out there and we don't have a it written down someplace it wouldn't qualify a lot of places if you don't already have it in your CIP as a vision and something you're planning to do you may not qualify it just depends on the grant and what comes out but a lot of them want to see that this is something you've already been thinking about to do am I wrong right I mean is that sometimes that's a qualified if it wasn't in the budget excuse me the last round that we just got for the locks and stuff qualified if it wasn't in the budget if it wasn't in the budget but yeah. this is so this is just having it in the CIP and the plan to show it's something that we would like to do. But I know that there's, I mean, well, I mean, we've, we've dealt with this with recreation on the town, that if you didn't have it in your, your CIP and something that showing that you were planning to do it and wanting to do it, you didn't qualify. Well, so. if two of the members of the board uh, that have, you know, a good deal of seniority feel that strongly about it, I'll withdraw that motion. I mean it doesn't I mean he can stay on there it really yeah. doesn't matter yeah. we yeah. just thought we'd clean up the list a little bit and Thank that was a, a big number ticket item that we thought had that a little kept no chance to move it was right. a huge ticket item there's so many things before it yeah. and uh, it was grossly uh, under represented as to what the cost would be because it was no and, and I, under I understand that but I'm no just points are taken as well it's, oh, it's oh, no. you know for just keeping it on there for the the idea of showing that we we have that impressed. thought and that vision, and and that's if, and you never know what could happen. I mean, something happens with the, the pack wall and, and it falls everything. down, and we have I'll to rebuild the area. Then maybe uh, <laughs> you incorporate it somehow. The direction of things. If we are going to address the science classrooms in a meaningful way, especially the ones along that that hallway, you know, uh, that could probably be incorporated into that area of the building. That type of a connection can be made as part of that type of a. You know, uh, improvement, facility improvement, because we do have science classrooms, uh, various <coughs> degrees, degrees of, uh, of disrepair, right? Yes. Yeah, it was on the report. All right, so you're going to withdraw your motion. Are you going to withdraw your second? No, I'm keeping it. You know, All right. right, motion and second has been withdrawn. Thank you so much, wise guys. You Bree? still haven't figured me out yet. I got nothing. I'm going to throw something at you as well as going to happen. Bree, Water bottles. anything? I have nothing. Paul, anything? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> any other business? Well, we don't have any correspond anything in the correspondence folder. We don't have vendor or payroll registers. Um, any other business? Yeah, I, I'd like to talk for a minute. One no. of the or two. Um, <laughs> boy, man, now look, I get that a lot at home. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Um, I want to talk a minute about the uh, the warrant, the construction project, and okay. we were given these phases the other night at the CIP. And I'm, you know, I have some concerns because this is going out over four years, and kind of the way we presented this to the public was that this was going to be done on the front end, that it was urgent, and that it had to get done. And that was one of the reasons why we, um, it's one of the reasons why we financed it the way that we did. So I guess one I know is there being are we putting together that focus committee? Uh, that works with our uh, EEI and the administration. Um, so, one, are we doing that? Two, uh, I would like to have them come back in and talk to us. And three, the only way that this can be, f I'd like to have a better understanding of what we're doing. It seems like the group is moving forward. Well, we have a fiduciary responsibility, and we really, as a school board, execute these warrants. Um, and it seems as though that things are moving forward without any participation from us. And that's my sense of things. And I have concerns. So I'd like to see that focus committee uh, with the five or six people like we spoke about. Um, 
I'd like to understand why this is out over four years, um, which, you know, really, I don't think it should be out more than two. Uh, and I think we can save some money. I mean, the idea here is to do the most for the least amount of money and get the biggest bang for the buck. Um, and I, I have a number of questions that personally I need to have answered um, as to the scope of work. So um, some of this is very straightforward and some of it is um, concerning in my humble opinion. So if someone wants to address the committee thing, that would be great. Um, well, well, yeah, and I'll, Maria, you. Maria, you're more than welcome. <laughs> yeah, well, I, if I may say, I know, Jack, you worked on it in the board last year. Uh, all these projects had been discussed and approved by the school board. This is not something that we just pull out of nowhere. It has been a two-year long process where we had have these discussions. We did have a committee. We did run all so, these projects through the <coughs> CIP committee as so, well. So this is not something that just came up with no direction or no, I mean, the, the, there has been a so, committee and a process that has been followed to get so, to this project. So there weren't, the, the way the contract is written up is that it's written up that we're going to do these energy and the way it was presented in the warrant, the way the warrant is written is that we're going to do these cost savings uh, projects, okay? The first year, we're putting in light bulbs. Right, which okay. is the largest savings project yeah. out of and, and the And that's the first list. thing we're doing. Um, we're going to have a construction manager on, and I don't know what the, and I'd just like to say, are we just screwing in new light bulbs, or does that come with new fixtures? Oh, these absolutely. Are, it's with new, new fixtures. fixtures. We okay. are changing these are the questions fixtures. I need we to are, have answered. We are implementing. Okay. And it also gives us the flexibility to look at other things that were on that list, right, to say, well, what is the priority of the board? The board manages this project. The board has the fiduciary responsibility of how this turns out. And if something shouldn't, it, it is our responsibility, the entire project. And I want to make sure that this goes off right. And we weren't 15 minutes into our first meeting where we were given something like this and said, this is what we're doing. And we need to have, I think as a board, more involvement. We need to be able to ask the questions we want to ask. And yes, we set a $25 million uh, well, a loan, for lack of a better term, to do cost energy savings projects. Now, me as being in the industry, I always want to kind of wrap up the envelope. In other words, make the, if you're going to spend this money on HVAC, if you're going to spend this money on boilers, I want to ask the question, and I have asked it, and say, well, we got the numbers, but I haven't seen the numbers on the windows, on the replacement of the windows. And then the question becomes, is that a better decision to, to divert some of those monies into those areas? Those are simple questions to be asked. We're still waiting for test results back on some of the masonry, so we don't even have all the data points yet to decide which are the most crude. I mean, it can come back, everything could be fine, and we move forward. But those are questions that I have. My biggest question is, as I look at this, it seems to me, and I could be wrong, that we are only going to do this work over the summers. And I, I got to tell you, are we going to run these projects? And, and another question is, when are we going to get the POs? When are these HVAC units going to be bought? Because the sooner we do this, and even the gentleman from EEI said, the faster you get this done, the more money you save. Those are legitimate questions to be being asked. And if if I thought this project was going to be a four or five year project, then maybe we should have looked at it a slightly different way. I think the understanding was, correct me if I'm wrong, that this was all going to be done in the first couple of years. And I just need, you know, I need the group in here to answer those kinds of questions. I think they're fair so questions. So I will say that the board did make the decision. There were multiple conversations, and which projects were done first was made a decision by this board. When was that? It was a several, I mean, there were several meetings, and they're all recorded, so you have... No, all, this board? Not this board, prior, well, prior board. The, the, it's not what the contract says, and in addition to that, and I'm not even saying we have to deviate this. I just want to make sure that the couple questions that I have get explored. We have some stuff on the masonry that they're testing now as part of that contract. 
that we haven't even gotten the test results, but they, they just took the test the other day. Do you have a list so, of your questions? If no, I, I want to do this in public. If I may, if I may respond to some of your yeah. comments. These questions had been asked, Jack. You can go back into the school board meetings last year because mm -hmm. a lot of these questions that you have had been answered this is by new, EI yeah. and by... This is a new board. Let her finish. Oh. Do not interrupt her. Uh, okay. So some of the questions that you have, yes, they're very, very valid questions. They had been answered. They had been open. These meetings are open to the public. Uh, and the, the board members that had been in this board, you know that these things, nobody pulled out these projects out of nowhere. This has been a process. It has been a two year long process that we have been following. The list as it was presented is a tentative list for many reasons. Because first, we are at the mercy of the supply. We have ordered some HVAC systems two years ago that we don't have yet. So I can tell you, yeah, that's that's a plan. That's not that's not set in stone that that's exactly how we're gonna do it. No, it's a plan because when you have a twenty five million dollar project that some of the some of the things in the in the plan cannot be addressed at a certain times because you cannot have roofers in the schools while the kids there's, are at school. There's, pl there's plenty of room. So and this is what I do for a living. So my question is if this was written in granite, right? Or you're saying it's not it's but not. say we go by this phased plan, and a question I would have is when are we going to purchase the other HVAC units? Or have they all been purchased? I mean, these are just simple procedural questions that need to be answered. And the Warren had it passed last year, so we could, you know, the last board can't make decisions for the new board. That's how it works. And I'm not even saying I want to make any changes. I'm just saying I want to make sure our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed, and that's why I want to have those discussions with EEI. And when I see this go out four plus years, boy, man, that throws up just some. I got to have that those questions answered. Why? What is this? What's the schedule of work? I'd like to see the schedule of work done on a calendar, the way every construction company does it. And so that's that's what I'd like to see. I think Mike was here last school board meeting, and you mm -hmm. did ask a mm -hmm. question. No, he wasn't. Yes, yes he, was. he was. He was here two meetings ago, right? Yeah. Was it the last meeting? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was the last meeting. Yeah. Well, we just we here. just we just got this at the CIP meeting. But Mark, we talk we did get it. So if I'm no, I, I think I'm sensing your part of your frustration is. Uh, the cadence of which these projects are being rolled out, and you'd want more understanding as to why the cadence is <coughs> slower than perhaps it could be otherwise, and you you would benefit from a more granular granular look at how this is being rolled out. Is that am I hearing you correctly? Even Mike said oh, if we work. Yes. What his answer to me was, we we plan on working just in the summers, but if we were to be able to work through the school year, that it would be a savings to the district. So. Has that changed that we now, if we made the decision to work through the school well, year? Well, I really think we're missing a key person, which is Carl. Yeah. Is who, so is who yeah. we need to have. So all I'm, I'm bringing up saying I want to have those, yeah. so let's Carl and, and Mike here. If I may Hold answer on. to your question, and if I can finish answering the, the inquiries that you have, I do understand what you're trying to get more information, and I'm trying to give you the information that I have. Um, the, pro the answer that Mike gave you was not that oh, these projects are only going to be done in the summer. Right now, we are converting all the boilers at Danville Elementary. Right now, as we speak, the project has been going on for three weeks. That is being done during school session. There's no, all those projects cannot be done when the kids are in, in, the, in, the, cl in the classrooms. If, if it's noise, if it's banging, if it's the roof, you can you can give a class, in, and educators, please help me here, that you cannot instruct a class if you're putting a, a roof above you. Actually, you have you gone by the Salem Middle School? It looks like a nuclear bomb went off, and those kids are in session. And and I can tell you, we should be able, with the, with the design of these two buildings, or any campus that we have, it, it, it can be very easily coordinated. And most of the work we have even scheduled here is is really on the roof or in rooms that are separate from the from the students. Now I don't know about the duct work that runs through the walls of the, the school and that can and that can and should be done in the summer. 
But again, I've had constituents of mine call me and say, Jack, why is this running four years? I thought this was urgent. I thought we had to get it done on the front end. So I'm I'm just not only am I concerned, but I have I have members of my town that are saying, Hey, what, what you know, why is this gonna take so long? So I'm gonna piggyback on Maria and, and again as she was saying, I mean there are things that are being done during the school year. Windows, thing, things are happening during the school year, but there are a lot of things that cannot happen during the school year. Yeah. And there are a lot of projects that have to be planned out as a result of that. One, it's finding contractors. Two, we have something that we have to, we're bringing in a gigantic crane yeah. that has to be done not during, it can't be done during the school year. You can't, you can't get it on and you can't have the liability of having that equipment and what they're doing with kids and people in the school when it's happening. Thank you, sir. What, where, is, then, where is that coming from? Where is that coming from? Yeah. I, I just went, I, you go to the, the Salem Middle School, they got five cranes out there. The gentleman covered it. In that last they they discussed it here yeah, at the last uh, meeting. What he they says is they're putting in a tower house. crane. He says they're putting in a tower crane. They're putting in a tower well, well, one crane no. in New England that can handle that unit that we have in the roof of the middle school. And we, I think we had a not a robust discussion. We we did have a brief discussion about we can't be intrusive to the environment of the students. Yes, yeah. yeah, right. Because you. Like I, I and I know we had this conversation because we talked like yeah, the pack did. wall when we did that. It was, we had to find parking, we had to move stuff, we had to do, it, it was a big project to do that, and that wasn't a big project. Like, but to try to find the space, move people around, create parking, create safety zones mm -hmm. for kids and do what we needed to do, and that becomes the issue. We don't have the space to so do let's, what let's, other schools do. We're, we're, we're not Salem, we're, we're a tiny, I cramped little- I want to be collaborative. The, the middle school so, parking lot at Salem is very small, but let's, let's talk about parking for a minute. Most of our buses at the high school run empty. It would be a novel. The kids could carpool. You, we have 80 acres on this on this campus that very easily we could create an extra 25 spots that would be taken up by any construction area that was needed or uh, parking for the construction workers. Which you know, if you roofers normally all get in a truck somewhere at the at their company and, and drive in together. So the whole if we're not capable enough of coordinating a project to, which is mostly on the roof and away from the students and the whole backside of the school really almost doesn't even have you know back where they did the pack center in that in that area really isn't obtrusive in my humble opinion to students now is it perfect I went to my alma mater the other night, day Westfield State they had four of their major buildings being completely renovated and one under construction and the kids are walking around like nothing ever happened. I'm not saying it's perfect, but when I think about the obligation we have to ourselves as a board, the taxpayers and the students, I mean, the faster we get this job done, the cleaner the air that they stop breathing sooner. I mean, it, it's, it, it grows exponentially. We have a, a better product for the students and the staff we save the taxpayers money and you know what four years to me is is not what I think we I, I just want to hear it from so the you're professionals. whether the timeline can be expedited well, that's one of the issues okay. that's one of, that's one of the questions and all I said was we were supposed to put together a, a, a focused group I think that should be a school board committee and then from there I have questions. I just I see this thing just people making decisions, and I, I don't really see anything being floated by the school. So would board. you be and happy if we made an agenda item where these people could come in and you could talk about it? No, I think the board. We we do make every decision as a board. If you, you a folks want to say, hey Jack, you know what? We think you're dead wrong. Bombs away. <laughs> but I, I got to tell you, I've been involved on campuses before, and and things just happen. And I want to try to be. A little bit of preventive maintenance and just be on the ball and make sure these this project goes off without a hitch because so when we go back to ask for more money I want people to feel good about it not bad about it so I'm gonna finish my comment from before we did talk about creating a group we talked about having some community members on there as well so that they could see and then they could be able to you know have an input as well and because we wanted to make this as transparent as possible we've talked about this since the a couple of times since this has passed and it is something that is being discussed and figuring out the best way to do it we talked about whether or not we want to do it as part of facilities which we said no or part of CIP, CIP. Was a CIP. 
we, we talked, it's something that's being discussed and trying to figure out the best way to do that, to create that, that subgroup that looks at this. Because if this comes back to the board meeting every single time, we're, we're not going to do it. So we are talking about that. It is something that's, that's just trying to figure out what we're going to do and the best way to go about it. I don't think that decision has been formalized yet, but it, it's in process. But shouldn't so, the board be making that decision? The board did make the we decision make when I asked Maria and Carl to figure out the best way for them to coordinate that with EEI and all these other people, because I'm not going to sit and talk to EEI and all these other people. They do. So I asked them to figure out the best schedule, the best way to us for us to create a group to do that. So that's kind of where we're, we're at. Right? We're at. It's been a month since the election, so... I mean, we're, we're still we're in process. It hasn't board. been you forgotten. You tell us who you, do you want in the in the committee, and we, we attend the committee. Just tell us when, who, and how. I told you, I, 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 there, I want a couple community people. I asked for Jack to be on it because I know he has the questions. Yeah. yeah um, just form the, then, form the from the group, and we're, Carl and I are happy to attend. We can ask. Well, that's what I'm saying. When, when figure out what makes the most sense with them work. and with the community members. And, and Jack and, and figure something out as far as one thing. How often? What makes sense? What's going to make sense based on? I mean, we don't want to be calling EEI in here all every day either and paying for them. Just I mean, we need to figure out a, a focus. So I, I think let's start with, with that original hurdle of those questions and that that kind of forecast, if you will. So that's bombs away. But there you go. But then we're going to have to clearly have some routine because, like I said, I want the transparency of moving forward. So. Just to make it clear one more time, that phasing is a schedule. It does say at the bottom of it, if you read it, if you read it, it does say there. That is a tentative preliminary schedule. Yeah. It's not set on rock. It's not, this is how we're going to do it. It's a plan. If, it's if, a forecast. If that had been it's, like two years, I would have been, probably wouldn't have been asking any questions. So. Okay. But I understand where you're coming from. So we're, we're all good. All right. It's a plan based on the current national circumstances of equipment labor because again so, we ordered yeah. With, without dragging this yeah, without dragging this out any longer right. i would hope that eei is already i mean is already looking at ordering the hvac units is already looking at potentially hiring contractors and lining those things up and getting those kind of updates get the questions out of my noodle Right, okay. I, I stop asking questions if if I just have those, to, and there's just a few construction. I mean, those are legitimate questions that anybody that's responsible for a project like this would be asking. Because sure. if you don't, now you're irresponsible. And then you know, the time and, to find out. And I out, guess Maria's point is those were asked by the previous board in leading yes. up to all of this, but, and that's that's where that came. But yeah. but this is a new board, and I understand that. So sure. we'll work on and the okay, committee. The and committee's we'll, being worked on, and everything like that. But is there any other business? Because I think we've beat this dead horse quite a bit. <laughs> do we need to go in a non-public? I don't think we do. No. No. Nope. All right. Any other board members? Nope. I'm going to close this meeting at 10:16. Thank you. I'm getting tired. Someday we'll get to the. <laughs>